Kulamasi Himohach. How are you all today? I'm Adrian Cummins. This is Brent Michael Davids. We are co-directors of Lenape Center. Lenape Center is a indigenous nonprofit which was formed here in Manhattan, or Manahata Manahatan, which translates as a place where we gather the wood to make the bows. It also translates as the island. This homeland that we welcome you to today is geologically 1.3 billion years old. And so in honoring all the life that has ever walked, that has ever lived, that has ever died, on it and through it, we understand and we honor all of our relations. And in this way, we welcome you today as relations, as relatives. The original people, the Lenape, have been here for a very long time in a homeland which begins in the south in the state of Delaware, uh, west into eastern Pennsylvania, north to the Catskills, east into a sliver of Connecticut, and a bit of uh, Long Island as well, and all of New York City. And so, in recognizing this homeland, we want to honor the people, honor the original people, the Lenape known as the grandfathers and the peacemakers. Yo, yo, way, yo, 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 way, yo, way, yo, hey, yo, way, ya, ya, yo, way, oh, way, yo, hey, ya, way, ya, oh, ya, way, yo, way, oh, way, yo, hey, when he let up, hey, 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 oh, way. Welcome, Anushik Wanishi. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian and Brent. Um, I'm Simon Dove. I'm a uh, director of CEC Arts Link, and I'm happy to see you all uh, assembled here, or assembling probably is a better word, um, as people come in still. Um, two practical announcements. Uh, first is that given the, um, the gorgeous snowstorm we had yesterday, uh, Simon Bro could not get his flight from Ottawa. So he's going to be Skyping in instead. Um, but given the vagaries of uh, travel in, in Canada, he was in Montreal for the flight, and his train back to Ottawa this morning is also cancelled. So he's currently on a train. <laughs> so that adds to the, uh, the drama of this afternoon. But the plan is uh, to Skype with him after the break. So essentially, 
what is in your program. Uh, we'll just move uh, 20 minutes earlier up to the break, and then we'll take the break, set up the Skype. We'll have uh, Simon on Skype, and then we'll go straight into the Foundation's uh, panel conversation. So I just want to welcome you too. Uh, just to say for us, this is a really important way in which we as CUC ArtsLink engage with what we are both thinking of doing, but also with the artists we're working with and how we begin to uh, frame and uh, develop the kind of work that we feel we need to be doing to support artists, both to help us all imagine and build the world as it needs to be, as it can be. Uh, and we wanted to bring people together to really share both approaches, ideas, and I hope in an inspiring uh, and informative way that starts to enable conversations to happen. So this is really a pilot. We're seeing if this feeds your work as much as it feeds ours, and I'm keen that you communicate with me by phone in meetings. Uh, my email is in the program book. Uh, let me know what we could be doing next year. We hope this could be an annual event, but I'm keen it can feed your work and support the artists that we work with both across the, s the, the United States, but also internationally. So, I, so please be in touch with me and let me know how better we can make this for next year. Uh, you should know, given the, 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 um, the tight time frame for everyone's presentations, we've asked people really to stick to their time. Uh, there won't be introductions from me for everyone. The slides will tell you who's speaking and, in theory, what they're speaking about. Um, we have a little uh, musical cue, so uh, if you start to hear a beeping sound, which uh, may, may emerge, ah, yeah, that. If you start to hear that when you're speaking, you know you have a minute left, and this music will slowly build up to a point where <laughs> You, even if you're still speaking, no one will hear you. So it really gives you a very clear sense of your time. And I'll be at the front waving signs too. So let's hope we run to time. We, we have a short break, uh, which if you need to take some air, please do. But uh, it will only be 20 minutes. So please be back promptly for the Skype session. Welcome. Let's assemble. Um, hi. Um, uh, I'm a visual artist, Asel Kadirhanova, and um, uh, I'm also a PhD researcher at the Uni University of Leeds. And today, um, with Inga Lasse, uh, curator, we will uh, speak about um, diaspora. And uh, yeah, diaspora is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, the word diaspora comes from the Greek word diaspero, which means to disperse or to scatter across. And basically it means a community of people who, were, who has dispersed or um, were displaced from their place of origin, of most often uh, because of traumatic event. And um, to be considered a uh, diaspora, uh, there shouldn't be just a, uh, just a mere physical dispersion. Uh, as um, to be considered a diaspora, um, people have to have or maintain a specific form of memory of their place of um, origin, the place that becomes um, a point of their cultural identity. And in my research, I look at the questions of memory and trauma in post-Soviet societies. In particular, I look at how um, uh, traces of historical trauma persist in time and how we might inherit the past that we did not live through. This is why, among other things, I became interested in diaspora. And I'm interested to research how memory and cultural identity persist throughout generations and um, with people's relocations, or in other words, in space and time. And it's important to remember that it's not just people who move around. Um, dispersions also means dispersions of uh, cultural values, languages, um, um, personal memories and personal traumas. This is my work called A Brick to the Vault that I made a couple of years ago for an artist resident in Kazakhstan. 
and this is installation I work with three alphabets of, of the Kazakh language. And I use the alphabets to address the issue of cultural identity. In the 20th century, under the Soviet rule, um, Kazakh alphabet was changed twice. First, the traditional Arabic alphabet was replaced by uh, the Latin alphabet, and then in the late 30s, it was replaced by Cyrillic. And at the moment, we use Cyrillic letters. And what is interesting, uh, it might sound abstract, but what, what's interesting, it was also the, way, the time of the wave of migration from Kazakhstan. People were trying to escape, uh, to escape starvation and political oppression. And later, these people formed a Kazakh diaspora abroad. And uh, what I find fascinating, that uh, Kazakh diaspora in uh, different countries use different alphabets. For example, um, people in China, Afghanistan, and Iran use uh, Arabic letters, and people in Turkey, Germany, uh, England, or USA uh, use um, Latin letters. So they cannot kind of communicate with each other in written language, um, although they speak, we speak the same language. And in this work, I use three um, three alphabets, uh, which I put on the cubes that appropriate the design of educational cubes for children. And on each side of the cube, there is a letter, the same letter, but in, in, three, uh, in a different alphabet. By walking past this installation, the viewer changes the angle, and each time they, they read it in a different alphabet, but they never get um, uh, the full view. It's always a fragmented view. Um, so uh, with this fragmented view, you cannot really grasp the entire phrase. And I would like to refer to the fragmentation of collective memory with many gaps and silences. So yeah, in this, with this installation, I would like to raise a question how everyone is a brick to the world. Um, and it's, it's on, on the other hand, it's a solid brick of identity, but um, on the other hand, it is um, kind of a brick that can be moved and make new, new towers of meaning. Thank you, Aso. Uh, yeah, so can we have the other image? Yes. Uh, so um, I will continue to speak about diaspora a little bit through the lens of the project called Portable Landscapes that I did with my colleagues and that is still ongoing actually. And uh, you can see an image here uh, from the project when it was exhibited in Riga at the Latvian National Art Museum. And so in a way, the idea of the project was um, uh, to work with uh, Latvian artists in exile, mostly the post-Second World War ones, and contemporary artists. And uh, so uh, we did this research because like uh, really after the Second World War, there was massive waves of uh, Latvian um, uh, people uh, that ended up uh, in many different places in the world. And so since there was a Soviet Union, there was no place to kind of come back. So this diaspora and exile scene, they really kind of existed parallelly, right? And uh, and we were thinking like, how do we kind of reintroduce it to the local scene in Latvia, but also how do we speak about that in New York, in Berlin, in Paris, like in the places where they actually lived and what does that mean? And uh, so the project started and one thing that I would like to raise with this presentation is sort of the curatorial and institutional responsibility that we have. Uh, especially we felt that we have it in relation to uh, European uh, refugee crisis. So there was this moment of crisis and it went on and we thought, so what can we do as an institution? And for us, it seemed that we need to talk about the exile or, or migration of the past, because in Latvia, the attitudes were very like sort of racist. And, and when the European Union division happened in 2015, that, oh, we need to take like 700 refugees, just like 700 from all these like that are flowing, you know. And um, and it created like an incredible kind of wave of racism and, and political crisis. So... We were like, how do we speak about that with the Latvian audience? And um, and that's why for us, that was this one reason why it was very important to speak about diaspora and say like, well, listen, but, you know, like not that far ago, so many people were sort of accepted in many different places, like Latvian people. So we should also think about migration today that it later it will create like a shared history. Uh, uh, yeah, So and, and that shared present should be maybe more different than, uh, you know, like surrounded by hostility. 
So, yeah, and, and the picture basically shows this one Latvian artist who lived in US and uh, her name is Diana Dagli. And it's interesting that in her work, she worked, uh, she made these three paintings, like the ones with refugees and the one with this woman in the 70s while living in America. And uh, you could kind of see these two things, you know, like one is really... Uh, she reflects on the refu the Vietnam refugees because she's like a perceptive, you know, like she sees what's happening in the world and, and in U.S. at the time. And the other one is uh, her family sort of arriving in U.S. So she already did that in the 70s, this kind of reflective work. And that uh, woman, it's more like about the role of uh, w women in America, you know, and in, the, in relation to consumer culture and all these things. So that's one of those, let's say, historical works. And um, so if I um, uh, still have time, I would like to just uh, read the quote <laughs> that was very inspiring for the, for the project. And so basically, um, it's from the catalog that we did. Um, so basically, migration resulting from uh, climate change uh, in, is particularly topical. Uh, nowadays and and it, there will be more and more of that yeah if not from wars then you know from the climate change because many territories will be completely underwater and uh, or become uninhabitable because of the higher temperatures so raising numbers of unregistered people may also pose a serious threat to democracy and cu currently existing structures of political representation and so the philosopher Thomas Nail offers an interesting way of looking at the situation. Uh, he suggests reviewing both history and the current political situation from the point of view of movement, migration, and the migrant instead of that of a static citizen. So Nail uh, calls his theory kinopolitics, uh, and it's a reference to social kinetics or movement. And so rather than uh, taking the preconceived notion of the citizen, as his point of departure, he uh, proposes, beginning with migration flows, looking at the ways in which migrants travel to become citizens and to form countries, and paying attention to how they often present an opposing force and an alternative to existing state structures. From a political point of view, a migration theory that takes movement as its prime consideration might be more inclusive than the one which prioritizes the citizenship. And uh, yeah, so in a way, while it seems like a riddle or, or like a weird utopia that we could look at the world like this, I think it's a, yeah, it's a great way to finish the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Laurel Patak, the director and curator of art in general here in New York City. Hi, I'm Michal Novotny and I'm the director of Center for Contemporary Art Futura in Prague. Uh, I wanna say a quick thanks to CEC Arts Link, to Simon and Maxime, especially for organizing us here today and for also allowing art in general to host an amazing fellow this year. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm here speaking with a former CEC Li Arts Link fellow Mikal, who I have had the pleasure of working with for the last five years in different ways to bring artists from across Eastern and Central Europe to New York. Um, and I had the pleasure of just opening an exhibition last night at Art in General that was guest curated by Mikal called School of Pain. The show is up until January 26th. I encourage you to come by and have a look. Um, in brief, the show looks at um, different ways to think about economies of desire in relationship to the work of some very interesting artists. And Mikal, maybe you could say a few more words about the exhibition. Uh, maybe I could just invite you on Saturday uh, for a screening and performance that will be between, between 4 and 6 in the afternoon, uh, where Mark Ter, who is a Czech artist, will screen a selection of his movies from the last 15 years 
that deal with two very different but somewhat connected topic of his queer identity and the stories of the Sudeten German, it's where the Czech German that were expelled from the country in 1945, because before the Second World War, 50% of the citizens of Czech Republic were actually Germans, and it's still a very tabuized topic. And there will be also Aditya Mandayam doing a kind of singing performance that also deals with his uh, complicated uh, cosmopolitan identity as he's half Sri Lankan, half Indian, but grew up in the UK and United States and now lives in Warsaw in Poland. Uh, so this will be till six. So uh, I couldn't help but want to ask some impossible, unanswerable questions in eight minutes. And knowing Mikhail to also be a complex thinker, I thought he would be up for the task. Um, but really, I guess the, the very subject of global citizenship really, and you know, the work that we do institutionally at Art in General in an international context has me thinking a lot about the kind of climate of the world in which we're working right now. And in a cultural moment when we're seeing such a disturbing rise in nationalism here and in many other parts of the world, I'm thinking a lot about you know, what is art's role? How can art work to um, counter or undo such extremism? And I thought Mikhail would be an excellent person to talk about this with because actually in your broader career and also in the kind of grouping of artists and even some of the themes of the works in the show that's up now at Art in General, I think you've done a really exemplary job of working together with local, regional, and international contexts and scales in your curatorial work over the last many years. And I was wondering how you think about this and you know, how can we um, maybe think about the local, the regional, or the international as ways to kind of counter um, ideas of nationalism. Uh, maybe I can. Yeah, so of course it's a difficult question. <laughs> But um, I somehow wish that, that the global kind of citizenship would work, yeah, that we could all be humans. This is a big topic in the philosophy that I studied, where the people somehow never accepted the, uh, the post-colonial and post-human studies. idea that, unfortunately, we cannot be all humans because there have been so much bad done that we need to first undo somehow that. So the question is how to deal with it. I mean, I think that maybe the answer is always to kind of try to conceive the full scale. Uh, so when I'm, for example, doing the program of Futura Center, Center for Contemporary Art in Prague, um, when I arrived there, it was mainly an international art center. So in the context of the first decade of the millennium, it was very important to bring international artists to Prague. But when I arrived, I also understood, and at that time, still many directors of art institutions were publicly claiming that they are conceiving their program like if it would be anywhere else in the world like that they would do the program whatever they would be, which is impossible in a way. You are always in a certain place in the world, and this place has a meaning. So I try to add, of course, many local artists that I think would need some help to be exhibited there. But uh, I think at least the art institution should work as a certain bridge. So they should bring people there and also help other people to live on this bridge. And they should uh, somehow work with this from a certain point that needs to be built. So they also need the international acclaim, but they also need a local acclaim. And um, what is mainly my technique is that I'm trying to smuggle people somewhere. I'm trying to smuggle people in the local discourse. And I'm trying to smuggle people in the international discourse. I'm trying to hide them in some trendy waves that they could be helping them to go up or the same to come to Prague. And the same I'm trying to play maybe uh, with the public that comes. In the Garden of Futura, we have those two public sculptures that I do not find very extraordinary what comes to their artistic quality, but they bring a lot of white public. And then we're kind of testing this white public in exposing them to maybe something what Inga showed here, to some problems that they didn't really come to deal with because they just came to take a selfie with those sculptures. <laughs> but um, I think that this exposure in a way works. Um, and maybe this is, you know, more a deep question that I would love to continue to think together with many people in the room and who are presenting later today about. But I think, you know, for me, thinking about this question, how can contemporary art negotiate identity when, on the one hand, it's something that is extremely tied to cultural belonging and geographical context, 
in really meaningful ways, um, but also to think about maybe what are the ide ideological structures that underpin much arts funding, um, because we see those structures as often legally, politically, and economically being quite bound to the logic of the nation state. So how can we kind of maneuver and work between those poles and terrain to think about what does it mean to undo or counter nationalism? There is usually two approaches in the public funding, and I'm running an institution that only runs on very different kind of public funding. Um, at the beginning, it was mainly the passport, right? The foundations usually support only the artists who hold the right passport. Over the years, and also by pushing of me and other directors, we mo more came to the agreement that it's more the place of residency. So for example, now Czech artists can be supported or let's say ar artists can be supported by the Czech culture institution even though they do not have the right passport if they reside and work there. But I mean this in a way is also complicated, right? This is just another way of exclusion. So what I'm also very often questioning in my practice and maybe coming back to the kind of upheaval of nationalism in also the region where I come from, the Central East Europe is experiencing a, a big wave of nationalism. And I think that this grows from the fact that we have all a kind of big inferiority complex, right? That in some ways the we need a sense of belonging and maybe also the art has pushed it away a lot from the discourse that it has. So one of the things that I'm also questioning how art could create this sense of belonging. And therefore I think that uh, institutions that receive public funding should maybe be in concert not so much of course with who they're doing, but if it's really meaningful because also often the kind of the cultural imperialist policy that for example residencies has been so much time used can be used well also despite the original fact that it is supposed to promote a certain nation culture and Europe this is omnipresent and of course the developed countries have uh, much more money for the cultural policy that the institute is a very strong funder pro Helvetia other funders but it doesn't mean that what the result is it's actually bad so we are somehow still, of course, bound in the national state, which kind of collapse with the global world. But we don't really know, and I do not have the answer how to really overcome that, except in some kind of positive sense of belonging, some kind of positive sense of patriotism, because we do need also this patriotism. Otherwise, it may strike back as, a, as the kind of hardcore edge nationalism. I guess we are. We have one minute. Maybe uh, then I would ask uh, you the same question. How do you conceive your program being uh, one of the few non-profit institutions in such a difficult space like, like New York is, also concerning to the question that you asked me? Yeah, um, I guess art in general has had a really long-standing uh, relationship to working with international artists. And it's an institution that was founded in the early 1980s founded by artists and uh, I think was very early to think a lot about what would it mean to bring artists from all different parts of the world to a place like New York and to do that with a very interesting, like paying attention to geopolitics. So I think for me, maybe in brief, listening to the noise that is gonna drown me out in, in a, any minute now, um, I just think you, one has to be really careful in thinking complexly about these things and to realize that we are, you know, we are bound inside a much larger system. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs>
is scenes from um, engagements that we have sponsored recently. The Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs is home to the Arts Envoy program as well as other cultural programs with not a very large annual budget, but roughly hovering at about $10 million a year. And our goal, our primary goal, is to put American artists overseas in meaningful interactions with foreign audiences to advance foreign, service, uh, foreign policy priorities. Uh, and while that advancement of foreign policy priorities is our mission, we do find that artists are both uniquely open to interactions with foreign publics and also incredibly selfish. So when they come back, they just take this experience and run with it, which is fantastic for us. 60 years ago next year, Dave Brubeck came back from State Department sponsored trip and wrote some music. And next year we hope to send his children back to Moscow to play that music and other music that he wrote. So we have a very long history. We recognize that art and artists go where no diplomat shall tread sometimes. They go where they find conversations where governments cannot talk to each other just yet. And they have profound impact on people that they encounter. We also believe it is important to maintain international exposure for American artists. And we are proud to contribute to the domestic economy by supporting our artists and hopefully inspiring them to make new records, new paintings, new theatrical productions, whatever it may be. Um, all the trips are inspiring and meaningful to those who participate in them. And I can say that bravely because we've run alumni surveys and that's what people tell us. The appetite for participation is more than what we can handle, which is great news. We um, also believe that the reason art has u this unique power is because we always put artists in meaningful interactions with foreign audiences. These are workshops or collaborations that they participate in. And the experience of making art is a uniquely democratizing experience. It is an experience of individual agency where the individual participa participating in the making of art is uniquely responsible for the outcome, the accomplishment, or the failure that results. And that experience of exercising one's agency may not be available to them in other spheres of their life, depending on what kind of society they live in. So art is an antidote to disenfranchisement and thus sows the seeds of a more equitable society. I think we also all know, and to comment on what Michal said, is that art also creates empathy. Whether it's through observing characters in a story that a person witnesses, or in a conversation with an artist, or in the process of making art together, the, an individual experiences the world through the eyes of another individual which is the definition of developing relation and empathy. And this, we believe, is the antidote to radicalization and violent, other violent ideologies that are based on dehumanizing the other. So every day of the year, somewhere around the world, there are two artists funded by the State Department, or rather two events funded by the State Department engaging foreign audiences. We would like that to be three. It will probably blow up our team, but we would like that to happen. Uh, we support several pro programs that I will name just so you can um, search for them or Google them. Our flagship program is Arts Envoy, um, and it has a short turnaround time from the first sort of idea of we would like X to travel to country Y and do this to the person being on the plane takes four to six weeks. 
Uh, we also have American Music Abroad, which presents Americana bands to audiences overseas. The application process is now open. We sponsor Next Level Residencies. These are collaborative residencies for beat makers, hip hop musicians, dancers, and graffiti artists. All of those in a group with local, uh, with local folks who do the same art. We sponsor Center Stage, which brings foreign artists to the United States, as well as the fall residency at the Iowa International Writing Program, which is also a very long running program with a lot of alumni. We operate in over 160 countries, and all of that was a fairly small budget. I will leave my business cards with Simon. We are very happy to be part of this landscape and hope to continue doing what we're doing. And there you have it. A politician, an elected official, may be that, but may not be necessarily a leader. A doctor may be your doctor, but may not be your healer. And today, we have the luxury of time and space with one another. And yet we may only have 12 years before Mother Earth may have irreversible, and already has, but damage that we may not be able to ever counterbalance. So we pose a couple of challenges today to all of you and to all of us. When we meet again next year, identify Courage, courage that is in your own work, in your colleagues, in your spheres of influence, in your creativity, of those who are not part of compartments, categories, elections, but those who are fearless and courageous because we only have a dozen years left, and that is those people who will, may lead us. Um, <clears throat> I'm a new um, part of the Lenape Center. Um, I was just brought in board um, as a co-director uh, recently, and one of the things I've been thinking about um, in that role, I mean, I'm a longtime musician and a composer, um, but I'm climate change, I'm feeling the same urgency about climate change. And for myself, one of the challenges is to, you know, what, what can I do um, as a music composer using my voice in music? But um, I started thinking about something else too, like, um, I mean, I, I've done what I can do individually. Like I have all the lights in my house are LED. <laughs> um, I recently installed, everything in the house is electric. So I've installed, uh, you know, solar voltaic. So I'm running my entire studio and my house off the sun. So I'm not, I'm off the grid in Wisconsin. Wisconsin uses 100% coal burning for electricity. And what, the thing I noticed personally about having solar power now in my house is that I never paid attention to the electricity before. I would leave a light on or leave my computer running. And now I know if I do that, I could run out of power. I have batteries, you know, it, but I'm paying more attention to what something uses. Like if my refrigerator, how much energy is my refrigerator using? And sometimes I hear it kick in and I run into the other room and I'm looking at my panel like, how much has it gone up? And so I, I'm much more conscious of what's going on in my own house. But I'm thinking, 
I want my entire, I live on an Indian reservation. I want my entire Indian reservation to go off grid. So how do we do that? You know, I'm, I'm the first solar powered building on the entire reservation. And you, you know, and I'm thinking, what, you know, what are we waiting for? So there's a kind of an urgency there. And, and the other thing I notice is that I haven't been paying attention to it. So I'm thinking now that the, one of the ways to do that would be sort of through immersion. It's almost like, you know how people learn languages, right? People learn Ojibwe and they want to revitalize Ojibwe. So they take classes and summer classes in Ojibwe language, but to really do it well, we, we call it immersion training. So you're learning language like Ojibwe, but you're learning math in Ojibwe. You're learning geography in Ojibwe. So everything's in Ojibwe. And I'm thinking, for me, as an artist, that's where my mind needs to go. Just like I wasn't thinking about the electricity before in my house, everything, my art projects, my musical, musical life, and I think it applies to everything. So if you're in sports, the question is, what does sports have to do with climate change? If you're cooking and, and, um, and you're an architect, what is architecture, what's the connection to climate change? And to start to think about climate change as immersion in all of the different aspects that we do. Um, so I don't know, that, I mean, for me, that's like my goal is to think how, it, this is something we're living with now forever. For, for the rest of our lives. It's not ever going to go away in our lifetime. So what do we do with it? And start to think, not, not to push it way over here with science or weather, or we have to create jobs first. We have to think about that first, and so we shove it way over there. But no, the, uh, the solution uh, is to bring it and put it into everything else so that we sort of are living and breathing climate change awareness and, and how do we, you know, live with it all the time? More like a friend um, in our life, <laughs> like this problem of climate change. So, um, I don't know. That's just my personal story as a composer and now part of this Lenape Center, which I just say is a wonderful organization. There are four uh, co-directors now, a founding uh, executive director, and then... Um, four of us, so we're like the Fab Four um, <laughs> in Lenape Center, and all of us are different, and we're, um, we have different strengths and weaknesses, and it's exciting to see what we're doing. Uh, but our goal is to bring the Lenape people back into the city. Of course, um, Manhattan was not sold for $24 worth of beads. Um, there was no sale at all. So the land was stolen. And um, we were all driven away. So we had also a Lenape diaspora. So one of the arts problems for us is arts and culture is to bring people back into the city, which is what we're trying to do. Um, and, you know, struggling to create ourselves. <laughs> and think of all these issues as well with the arts that we have going on. And um, I'm very grateful to be a part of that organization. And um, I don't know, climate change. <laughs> so, I was just waiting for the music to start so we can start. Like, so it's a two-part challenge: <coughs> identify courage and figure out immersion. How do we immerse ourselves and everyone else around us into it being one motion, all of it, everything that we are and everything that we do? That's our way forward. One ishi. Hi everyone, my name is Sebastian Sansa Santa Maria, former co-founder of Residency Unlimited. And I'm Ashley Tucker, I'm the program director at Artistic Freedom Initiative. Huh. <laughs> Title's missing. 
Um, so today we're going to talk to you about a residency program for at-risk artists. It's titled the New York City Artist Safe Haven Prototype. The prototype supports artists who are persecuted for their work, threatened on the basis of their political or religious affiliations, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender identity, or has been forcibly displaced, needs a respite from dangerous situations, or are from countries experience experiencing active violent conflict or oppression. The concept was workshopped back in 2011 when Residency Unlimited created a panel discussion on artist residencies in conflict areas in partnership with Goethe Institute and was subsequently workshopped at the Collaboration Laboratory on Wasan Island in Canada in its partnership with Three Dimensional. Some of you may know Three Dimensional is a 10-year project <laughs> activating at-risk, supporting at-risk artists through the artist, International Artist Residency Network. And um, from that, the idea came that while it's complex and energy consuming and difficult to support, to get artists out of danger, once they are out and in places like New York City, they're left to the challenges that is being here with little access to community or resources. And so the premise is that like-minded organizations and institutions and initiatives would share resources together in support of artists who are here temporarily or permanently depending on their situation. And so basically short-term, long-term, and um, providing resources like psychosocial resources, legal, housing, employment, education, professional development. Um, as, a si as my side from Residency Unlimited, which some of you know supports visual artists within the residency context, um, that organization would extend its professional development to a visual artist at risk. Um, and this was in 2012, so seven years later. Uh, the challenges that happened back then that took so long for the program to take form was basically what everyone deals with in this city, and that's housing. So, um, so it took a while to get to it. So now we're going to get to it. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sort of how this coalition came together and what each one of these partner organizations represents within the coalition. Um, it really started, as Seb said, with the housing. Um, West Beth, some of you may know West Beth Artist Community over in the West Village of Manhattan. It's been around for a long time, very much an institution. They approached um, Todd Lester, formerly of Three Dimensional, now of ArtistSafety.net, um, with the idea in mind that they had a, a little bit of surplus housing and they wanted to utilize that for the purposes of helping in some way with the, um, with the Syrian refugee crisis. And in speaking with Todd, uh, he kind of steered them in the direction of looking at at-risk artists as um, a really interesting and, and important way that they could contribute this surplus housing. At-risk artists may need a shorter term housing period than perhaps a refugee might need, for example. So it seemed like this was a smart way for West Beth to utilize this resource. Um, some of the other resources that were missing in the development of this program were legal services, for example. If we're talking about artists who are coming from other countries, certainly if there are no immigration attorneys who can help them with the legal work that they need to be able to stay and work and continue to create art, then again, it's not possible. So. Todd and um, artistsafety.net were really called upon to be sort of the masterminds between, b behind developing the strategy and capacity building. They began to identify some various partners that they could bring on board who would really sort of complete the picture and fill in the gaps that, that had existed since 2012, um, as Seb mentioned. So the first organization is um, the one that I'm the program director of, Artistic Freedom Initiative. Um, we, our, our mission is essentially as immigration and human rights attorneys to provide pro bono immigration representation to artists under threat. 
So in addition to that, we also facilitate resettlement assistance that looks like matching artists with residency programs, grant fellowship opportunities, emergency funds, things of that nature. And um, this residency program is a part of that resettlement assistance that we offer. Uh, lastly, we also partner with um, arts and culture organizations, museums, galleries, um, curators to put on um, exhibitions, performances, any, and create these platforms and opportunities for artists to showcase their work. So our contribution to the coalition is primarily providing um, the legal services that these artists need in order to be able to stay and work. The Westbeth, of course, um, providing that critical piece of the puzzle. Um, they've offered us, at this point, we have two active units, and we are hoping to extend that up to six over the course of a few years. Um, it's This is a look inside, actually, the first studio that they offered us. Um, I am very proud to say that I went shopping at Ikea and got all the furniture for this and built it all myself, including a bed frame. Pretty impressive, right? So not only do we offer legal services, but Ikea construction services <laughs> as well. <laughs> we have a second unit that's active now, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And so then Residency Unlimited provides the artistic support. Um, Residency Unlimited started in 2009 as a sort of alternative format to, to the centralized uh, studio structures, like studio programs that exist in the city. And um, the program really sort of is in tune with the concept of the partnership that is that Residency Unlimited is, is, has an event space, but Essentially, it works in a horizontal, decentralized way, and it really thrives by creating relationships and partnerships with other organizations and other institutions, whether it's to levy a gallery or a studio space or help an artist ride a horse down Broadway. I did that once. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, so it's really, it, it provides the resources that a visual artist um, would need to nurture its, uh, his or her practice. And then artistsafety.net really is sort of the resting place for the original free dimensional um, and critical resistance fund, which started almost now 15 years ago. Um, Todd Lesser, the founder, um, started with free dimensional and then, and then essentially really plays a role as, as the glue for all the coalition partners for this prototype. And, and also provide sort of expertise on intake and experience on the complexities of identifying and activating artists at risk. Uh, the PEN America's Artists at Risk Connection is a relatively new program, though PEN America's been around for a long time. Uh, they work, they are a free expression advocacy organization essentially working with writers at risk. So the second unit that's currently active at the Westbeth is managed by PEN and Artists at Risk Connection in conjunction with Fordham University, who has made space uh, for a, a writer at risk to do a teaching fellowship at Fordham University. So we have a a visual artist in the first unit and a writer in the second unit. These are our artists. Um, Hadi Nasiri was our very first artist in the first unit. He's um, from Iran, visual artist, multidisciplinary though, also interested in film. Um, the second artist here, Kanchana, she's the writer at risk that I mentioned. She's in the second unit. Hadi completed his uh, year-long fellowship residency at the Westbeth with us um, in the summer, this past summer, and he's since been replaced by our second visual artist in residence, uh, Rashwan Abdelbaki, who is from Syria. He is a, a painter and printmaker, um, and we're very excited to share that he will be on exhibit in um, in December at the Queen's Museum, we're opening a show there for a month, and he will have his beautiful paintings there, so come and see him and meet him. <laughs> and then the project is supported by the Shelley Don and Rubel, uh, Rubin Foundation, the Art and Social Justice Grant um, that we got funded for this year, and we're actively um, awaiting the answer for next year. Um, yeah. And then upcoming... So this is what's in store. We are hoping to expand the project to up to six units so we can provide for more artists. Um, we are working on a guide to safety hosting that's New York City specific and that can be replicated to other, ci other cities. And in conjunction with that, we want to do some workshops and training for folks who are interested in trying to do something similar. 
and there's our new website, so check it out. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Leah. I'm just getting Mike on the phone here. <laughs> That's how we do. <laughs> hey, Mike, I'm going to have you on speakerphone. Join us. OK, so um, my name is Leah Tawil. I'm an artist and a curator. And on the phone, we have Mike Corey, who is my collaborator and also an uh, artist and curator. Mike, you want to say hi? Hello. Hello. Cool. Can you hear that? Yeah, I can hear you. OK. Can you hear him? Yeah. Cool. Sort of? Mike? OK. Um, so I think what we're going to start with, actually, before I launch into uh, kind of a description of Arab experimentalism, which is what Mike and I will be discussing, I just wanted to glimpse our work together. We've been working together since 2006. And um, this is our sort of, like I would say, touchstone work called Atlas. Um, which premiered at New York Live Arts in 2016 and has had some international uh, touring, which has been very interesting. So um, let's just play a, a few, like, less than a minute of it so you get to uh, see what we do. I'm just going to leave that playing um, while we talk. So, um, uh, right, you get the idea. So, <laughs> um, so they're just watching me roll over and over again, Mike, just FYI. Um, so uh, Mike and I operate in a field called Arab experimentalism. Um, what we're, what the two of us are mostly art articulating with our work is live art practices. So obviously there's um, a whole kind of um, intersectional field into like visual arts and written work and this whole thing. But we're going to just talk about the body and sound and space and time. So um, Arab experimentalism um, can be defined multiple ways. I'm going to define it as um, a field that narrates and accumulates uh, regional and diasporic realities and futures through transgressive arts practices. How's that? Um, let's see. One of the main uh, tenets of, um, of Mike and I's work and sort of the sort of the ethos of experimentalism from an Arab perspective, particularly as Arab Americans, as Mike and I both are, um, is uh, the premise of we own our narrative. So the idea that we own our narrative and we own our references is almost of utmost priority um, because of the way that our culture is narrated over and over again for us, and usually misnarrated for us <laughs> by people not from the community. So this idea that we can narrate ourselves is really important. I think that a lot of, I think that actually works um, hand in hand with a lot of 
uh, arts that are situated in diasporic communities, as was discussed earlier. So we've kind of layered up a discussion really beautifully today already about diaspora and narration and identity and, and also safety and visibility. Um, so I think I'll... Um, I think I'll start actually by asking Mike a question and then we can bounce around a bit. Um, so Mike, since they're watching Atlas, <laughs> um, I thought that it might be interesting to discuss like, how Atlas sits um, when it's performed in the United States versus how it's performed when it's performed abroad. Um, and sort of the, also maybe address the visibility of um, this, like new, like a new Arab voice that we talk about a lot. Yeah, I think the work um, can be read in different ways depending on where we've performed it. Um, Leigh and I have performed this work uh, domestically here in the U.S. We've uh, we performed it in New York. We've performed it in San Francisco. We've also performed it in Berlin and Beirut, and um, it. It gets read differently depending on where we're performing it. Um, when we performed it in Berlin, um, it was very well received, and it was a largely it was a um, uh, sort of a Palestinian festival of arts in the diaspora. So it, it very much fit in with the uh, with the context of what was taking place there. Um, in Beirut, um, there's a lot of uh, politics at play, and it's um, a very avant-garde community in which we performed it, so it got read in yet a different way there. Um, and then in the, in the United States, it, um, it, it gets read even more so differently. Well-received, but some people try to, I think, take some time, or some of the audience tries to take some time, or curators for that matter, too, uh, to reconcile how it fits in with their narrative or their notion of what it means to uh, be an Arab artist. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it might be the case that people are looking, when they hear the word Arab, you know, they also might identify with a little bit more traditionalism or expect to see something like that. And although there are elements of um, uh Arab arts and culture and that tradition in the work, they might not be overt elements to people. And so there's a reconciliation process that people um, may or may not have to go through to understand how it fits in with it. But that kind of goes back to uh, what Leigh was saying about Arab experimentalism and that it's very important for us to control that narrative um, and, uh, you know, be able to demonstrate the connection of how it fits in the lineage of history. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Sure. Uh, um, so this uh, this idea of also um, that was discussed earlier inherency and inherited information and uh, the idea that you know Mike and I both being sort of first second generation Americans, um, Palest he's Palestinian, I'm Palestinian and Syrian, um, that we have this information in our bodies that doesn't necessarily need to be um, legible on stage, and, and that I think is key to the practice. So the inherent knowledge that we have, whether we experienced it firsthand or ancestrally, um, is, is resonant in our body. Um, and so just placing the body and whatever else we need to say with it on stage redefines it. the Arab body, also defines Arabness in a way that does not have to, we don't, ha we don't take on the burden of explaining that to um, a willing or not willing public, we just jump ahead to knowing it and then moving into the work itself. Um, I think it's interesting to uh, state that um, the work by its very existence of Arab experimentalists, um, even just by its existence, actually challenges the narrative or can offer new representations to the conversation um, without having to, um, just in its existence and in the naming of the context. Um, and that's a really uh, thing that, that's a thing that I think is getting more visibility. I feel like um, there's a lot more um, attention and mm, subtlety in Arab 
representations on stage these days, like just of recent, and we can see that also in like um, visibility and um, recent funding. So Mike just received a Night Arts Award in Detroit, which is a prestigious grant that um, not only uh, was Mike one of the grantees, but of the 25 grantees, I think there were five um, Night Arts um, funded projects that were related to um, Arab experimentalism, and five out of 25. And w this was a coup, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's very exciting to see it come into play. Um, so Mike, I'm sorry we, we didn't get to hear from you again, but we're getting the, um, the tone that our minutes are over. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. My name is Bojana Zakalujna. Hi, my name is Vyacheslav Ilashev. Uh, so um, my name, again, is, um, I'm coming from Ukraine, from Lviv. Um, I'm the I'm director of uh, Jan Factory Art Center. Uh, connecting these words, Jan factory and art, means that I'm dealing with transformation of industrial buildings. Uh, and um, I'm in charge of creating a new industrial space, um, a, a new art center in former industrial space. Um, Reusage of uh, buildings um, is relatively new topic, uh, especially in Ukraine. Um, it um, has no more than 10 years. Um, um, the the approach to transformation um, instead of uh, demolishing building has a lot of um, uh, purposes there. So uh, um, it is known that um, uh, reusing buildings brings uh, new values like uh, environmental, uh, social, uh, and economic. Um, so and as well, we connect to the history, to the past, uh, by creating new values. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the place um, uh, and the space which I'm dealing with. Uh, in the city, um, a, a more than 800,000 inhabitants uh, in the northern part of the city, um, there are a lot of industrial spaces uh, and um, uh, in the city that is known um, of being um, a cultural, uh, um, um, a that has a lot of culture, but rather traditional culture, there is uh, no um, a space for um, contemporary art. Um, the building that you can see in, in the image um, um, has quite an old history. Um, uh, it is known as the Jam Factory Art Center. Uh, but people forgot about this uh, building that actually originally in the 19th century, it used to be uh, a Jewish distillery factory. Um, and um, um, the building, is, um, as you can see, is um, in this, um, looks beautiful, but in a way um, it is falling apart. Um, in, in most of the property in, um, in Ukraine is, um, is private. Uh, and um, st uh, in 2008, this building been purchased uh, by a local businessman. Uh, but um, um, due to economic crisis after 2008, it was really hard to deal with the property. And an owner allowed art organization um, to come there and create art. Um, it was a space of freedom to create um, contemporary art and bring something to uh, the city. 
Um, so as you can see, a lot of international artists, mainly from different um, um, uh, countries and that bordering uh, Ukraine uh, came and had contemporary art weeks there. Um, so in uh, 2014, um, I've been one part of the group of people that, uh, that approached the building and started thinking of what we can do with the building and that we know that we need a space uh, uh, for contemporary art in our city. Um, and we created a plan um, what we want to use to this building to be. Uh, so we analyzed uh, actually the neighborhood and we saw that a lot of what kind of problems are there uh, and uh, what actually we dream about. Um, uh, in uh, 2015, um, uh, a person that um, a Swiss uh, that has one uh, um, organization that exists more than 10 years in the city actually purchased the building and uh, offered uh, uh, of um, uh, the purchased the building with the intention of creating the uh, art center there. Uh, and I was invited to work with um, Harald Binder Cultural Enterprises. Um, so later on, uh, two years, um, we've been working on the transformation of that building into an art center, contemporary art center in the um, The um, uh, so the, um, as you might see in, in the building, this is the architectural project. Um, and um, all the complex of buildings are um, go um, going to be transformed into a contemporary art center uh, that deals with uh, different forms of art, uh, music, theater, and uh, visual art. Um, so this will be the biggest um, space in our city for contemporary art. Um, and um, uh, last year we have started um, not um, due to the complex of um, process that we had to pass uh, to transform that building. We have started uh, using um, um, some buildings uh, around uh, for programming. Uh, and we started to deal mainly with Ukrainian uh, artists and had some programming. Um, uh, right now, we are about uh, to start the re renovation, and the Contemporary Art Center will, will, will be open in the uh, beginning of 2021 in Lviv. So, and, uh, as I mentioned, the purpose is to deal with various forms of contemporary art and um, to connect um, and present Ukrainian artists as well, artists uh, worldwide, and present them in our city. So I pass to Vyacheslav. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vyacheslav Yavashenko. I'm from Krasnoyarsk, uh, which is a city in Siberia. I'd like to talk about the project, that, uh, two projects that I was personally involved in. in at <laughs> the oh my God. The first, uh, fir fir <laughs> uh, first one was uh, Arkstayanie. Uh, Arch Arkstayanie is a very interesting event. Uh, which has uh, kind of an interesting history. Um, also, want to talk about recycling art, how it affected <laughs> my uh, curatorial approach. Uh, from Slava. Yeah. You can advance to Slava uh, here. Uh, uh, That's why you have this thing. <laughs> I thought it was, was microphone, actually. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So Ian, uh, the story behind the event is kind of interesting. 2006, uh, um, some of the woods around the village, which is in 200 kilometers from Moscow, which is approximately 130 miles, quite far, were affected by uh, Colorado uh, potato beetle. So about up to 35% of woods were destroyed. And uh, an artist and architect, Nikolai Poliski, who owned the house there, came up with an idea of making a sculpture out of the woods and all nine uh, remaining residents were involved. Uh, so some of the objects were created and uh, it uh, attracted a lot of interest. People traveled, uh, the, the local residents uh, even had a chance to travel internationally. And so next year, a lot of uh, architects, local and international wanted to participate. So uh, you can see the place, uh, uh, Nikola Lenivitz village also has uh, kind of historical significance to Russian history. And uh, slowly, like, uh, they started building projects out of the woods uh, that remained from this uh, Colorado 
uh, beetle epitome, and then um, so mostly uh, recycled materials uh, have been used there. But slowly, uh, uh, projects started, uh, started growing, and up to the year uh, 2011, when I joined, uh, it became uh, uh, kind of a very large event uh, with uh, more than uh, 10,000 people visiting. Um, in um, 2013, I came back to my hometown, Krasnoyarsk, thinking that I can bring some of the experience that I gain, gained in Arkstayania back home. And um, we organized an open call uh, of, of, of between architects and, and architectural students and artists uh, for recycle uh, art objects, which uh, we received a lot of applications, uh, which we uh, installed in few locations uh, in Krasnoyarsk downtown, in university campus, and uh, uh, youth center. We mostly use palettes in our first event. That's actually our second event. Uh, and uh, palettes, tires, any, anything that we could scavenge, uh, because we had uh, we were self-funded, uh, so we uh, didn't get any any uh, money from uh, the government, and we had very kind of uh, limited uh, f uh, support from the foundations. After uh, the presentation of our. Uh, festival, which happened in one of the youth centers, which was visited by mayor of the city, uh, next morning some of the uh, objects went missing, which we saw as a good sign <laughs> of gradual involvement of people. So our, in our next event, we, uh, should I stop? <laughs> okay, okay, our, that's our next event, okay? Uh, that's uh, student and local residents got involved fully. So, I mean, as far as we can. And so uh, some of the objects were able to uh, survive the winter, okay? And Tretikov Gallery, our last project this year in Moscow. So some of the uh, landscape, uh, famous landscapes uh, made by Russian uh, uh, artists were thought by our uh, artists. <laughs> okay, thank you. So thank you everyone. We'll take our break now just for 15 minutes if that's okay. Uh, be back at uh, 3.45 for Simon Bro, uh, we hope, live by Skype. Thank you. Hi everyone, if we can uh, reassemble. Uh, Simon is in his office, he's on Skype. Uh, and ready to talk to us. So, um, in a moment, once everyone's in, uh, it'll be Simon Pro. We don't have his slides, but uh, he's happy to to front his uh, his talk to us. So here he is, Simon. Welcome. Thank Mer you. Merci pour tout. <laughs> so, um, so we're ready. Uh, yes. Let's um, let's okay. be let's begin. Okay, first, I, I, I really uh, want to say that I'm absolutely sorry uh, that I was not able to, uh, to find a flight for New York. Yesterday night, there was a big uh, snowstorm uh, and in La Guardia and in Montreal. And I had this very surrealistic moment after being four hours on the tarmac in Montreal. We had to go back, uh, you know, I had to go back home. And I went through the American custom. And um, the man asked me, so what, what are you doing? Why did you want to go to the U.S.? And I said, to talk about culture. And he looked at me and said, why? <laughs> I said, because that's my, that's my job. And he said, so are you paid for that? And I said, so, so it was an, an, an interesting moment about going to the U.S. to talk about culture. So I just um, want to uh, start by saying that... Uh, by giving some context about uh, the situation of the Canada Council for the Arts right now in Canada, we are in a, as you know, we are an arts funder. So our mission has been for the more than 60 years to champion uh, the art and to uh, support the art to make sure that uh, as many Canadians could enjoy 
the benefit of the arts. Um, in uh, three years, two years ago, uh, we had uh, three years ago we had a new government elected in Canada, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and during the election campaign, uh, part of his platform was that if elected, they would double the budget of the Canada Council for the Arts. This is a, a, a situation that is absolutely uh, so far unique in the world. Uh, we saw over the last uh, few years uh, a slight decline in terms of public investment for the art. And I would argue that the model of uh, an arts council or an organization like the National Endowment for the Arts in the U.S., for instance, is a model that is uh, being uh, marginalized since many years in many, many countries. And government took different directions uh, being con because they are convinced that uh, uh, investment for the arts, if they make any investment, should uh, generate more economic wealth and therefore should be uh, tightly controlled by, uh, by them, by the bureaucrats or the politicians. So the model of uh, an arm's length agency making decisions about funding the arts with a certain independence from the government and, and, and being in, in fact quite free in, in a way it makes its decision uh, is, I would say, less and less popular across the world. But in Canada, our government made that very bold decision to double our budget over five years. And it is at the same, it's so, so in 2021, the Canada Council will, will enjoy an annual budget of $360 million, which is quite a significant amount of money for a federal funder. But for us, what is, what is really important right now is that we, we realize that, uh, I mean, it's good to have more resources, but at the same time, it's a huge responsibility because the last thing in the world we could do is to try is to do more of the same. The last thing in the world we would do uh, would be to just distribute that money to the existing clients of the Canada Council, even if they are uh, insisting a lot that they have a lot of uh, needs. Uh, we realize that uh, we need to make sure that our investments are transformative and in fact are uh, bringing uh, new uh, powerful voices uh, in, uh, in the uh, cultural landscape and that we will deal with uh, issues uh, around uh, cultural rights, cultural democratization, uh, in the impact of, uh, of arts on the daily life of citizens and all that in a way that both innovative and noticeable for uh, our fellow citizens, including for, a, for our government. So the Canada Council over the last uh, few years have been through an immense transformation, a radical transformation. And to just give you an idea of the scope of that transformation, uh, I arrived at this as a CEO uh, uh, four years ago. And one of the first thing I said when I arrived was that there was a need to, to recreate, to, to, to modify the way we do fund the arts. And we went from 150 programs, roughly, that were uh, devoted to support every possible artistic discipline with the, the ultimate goal of uh, maintaining what we considered to be a healthy ecosystem. So we went from 150 programs now six programs. So it means that the vast majority of, uh, of the staff of the council um, is occupying uh, new jobs now, working in different teams. And we reinvented completely the Canada Council with the idea that we should have a clear idea of what are the desired outcomes of our investment, that we should have capacity to act in a strategic way, as opposed to be only reactive, that uh, we would invest 25% uh, uh, of all the new money that the Canada Council is receiving over five years for applicants who never got a grant from the Canada Council so far. 
that uh, we would uh, explore uh, new territories in terms of uh, like the digital, that uh, we would uh, triple our investment for supporting indigenous artists in our country, moving uh, from a very Eurocentric way of supporting indigenous art to support indigenous uh, artists on their own term. So uh, recognizing uh, self-determination and sovereignty of the uh, first peoples of our land in their uh, choices to express themselves and to conduct uh, their artistic activity. And, um, and obviously we also said that uh, International would become more and more prominent in terms of our preoccupation as an Arts Council and not only, uh, and certainly not in, in a way that, that is uh, one way. So not only in terms of trying to make sure that Canadian artists will present more their work on the world stage, but also that uh, we would have a reciprocal approach and that we would really try to build sustained uh, relationships with different uh, nations in the world through uh, exchanges with their artists and their artistic companies. Over the last uh, few uh, weeks, I've been uh, traveling a lot, which is uh, a lot outside Canada, um, and uh, to engage in, with, in, in discussions with uh, uh, France, uh, UK, uh, Mexico, um, and, and, and to, to, to try to, to, to explain you know, what will be uh, the terms of engagements that we are proposing uh, for the future on the international stage. And it's also uh, kind of a, an offset of a big initiative we took uh, last May in Ottawa when we organized uh, the first America's Cultural Summit and we invited uh, nearly 200 artists and thinkers and uh, um, professionals of the art sector, politicians, diplomats uh, from 34 countries of the Americas to discuss uh, how we could uh, have a, a, a more link on this continent in terms to advance and to give more space for arts and culture in our respective country, but also in the way we deal or, or we exchange between our countries. We, uh, what is very fascinating right now is that no matter uh, you know who you talk with and in, 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 in no matter where which country you are trying to have the discussion about the future of the arts, you realize that the major challenges that are confronting uh, various cities and countries are similar and are also deeply interconnected. Um, it's clear that the issues of social isolation, uh, that uh, identity-based clashes and ultimately a growing deficit of social cohesion are a matter of concern everywhere in the world. This manifests in different ways at different levels from the rise of populism and nativism in the political sphere right down to racist comments in everyday conversations at the street level. These challenges have been, I would say, exacerbated by a system that prescribe more and more our behaviors, be they political, economic, nationalistic, organizational, and perhaps about, about, above all, algorithm-driven platforms. In this context, decision-making at the highest levels have been plagued with polymit, poly, polemical uh, struggles that place uh, winning an ideological battle over finding real solutions for the good of everyone. This has led to a general sense of disempowerment, resentment and anger, and widely felt anxiety about what the future might hold. And this sense of disempowerment is only perpetuated as people seek out solutions to the various problems of our world only to discover that the existing resources fall short. But in this quest for viable solution to create happier, healthier, more secure, and more prosperous societies, however, 
the arts are often overlooked. This is, in my opinion, an irony to this because the arts have the incredible capacity to bring diverse people together, to foster communication among them, and encourage their collective exploration of ideas and human experiences, rather than offering prescriptive or reactive solutions. When I speak about the power of the arts, I'm reminded of how the arts community in Canada came together uh, recently to welcome the over 4,000 refugees who arrived uh, in recent years from Syria. And in December 2015, so three years ago, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts partner with a private company, Sun Life Financial, and put out a call to offer support to arts organizations that wished to provide free access to refugees to a performance, an exhibition, or an arts event in their communities. And we had dozens and dozens of organizations across Canada who responded. One of these was the Vancouver's on the West Coast, Bard on the Beach Shakespeare Festival, which is a not-for-profit professional Shakespeare festival that presents its play every summer on the waterfront of Vancouver in Vanier Park. In the summer of 2016, Bard on the Beach prepared to welcome an audience of Syrian refugees, recent refugees, to a production of The Merry Wives of Windsor. Before the performance, they prepared a plot summary written in Arabic to make it easier for the Syrian families to understand. They also sought advice from the refugee service organization that accompanied the Syrians, Immigrant Service Society of BC, and their response was generous. The organization prearranged the connection between the festival, the refugees, and sent members of the team to the performance so that the refugees would recognize a few familiar faces in the audience. During intermission, members of the audience went out of their way to welcome the newcomers, speaking to them and meeting their children. The Syrian families loved the experience. For most of them, it was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. This initiative, and I could give many, many examples, exemplifies the great potentiality of arts to play a role in building great, greater social cohesion through, of course, it through, of, through, though, of course, required a timely coordinated response from several players, including arts organizations across our country, not-for-profit in the immigration sector, a private financial organization, and so on. But this kind of coordinated activity that is not easy at first, but I think it can demonstrate a leadership in responding to emerging issues in our world. And I'm confident that it will become a more fluid process as more and more people look to us to forge the path ahead. But I must say that when I announced that initiative with the Syrian refugees, it was a big surprise, both for my staff and for the artistic community. Why a Canada Council a granting agency would care about an issue like that? And my response was that if we don't care about what concerns uh, our fellow citizens, if we don't show that we can partner with other people to address issues or challenges that are important, and we only focus on you know what on 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 the arts and saying how great it is, we miss the opportunity to be part of conversations that are meaningful. And in return, we miss the opportunity to demonstrate how relevant the work we do is uh, for people in their daily life. Of course, if we want to play a stronger leadership role in addressing the emerging issues uh, of our in our world, we need to think very carefully about how the arts reflect the diversity of our world. And I'm thinking of an important idea that was introduced, uh, I just mentioned the summit that we had last May. During one of the panel, there was a studies academic named Elisa Chandler, and uh, she noted how there is a lot of discussion in the arts sector right now around the 
exclusion of marginalized people. But that if they are being included, those marginalized voices, into institutions or practices that continue to be racist, colonial, ableist, or other exclusionary practices, then progress is not truly made. She spoke, Elisa, about how she was inspired by the efforts of indigenous artists and arts, and arts organizations in our country in advocating to the mainstream, whether it be arts funders, leaders in the arts organizations, producers or presenters, of the importance to move beyond inclusion and make space for others to lead the way. Indeed, at the Canada Council, we continue to engage an important conversation for how we can make space for marginalized groups to lead the way in the arts, including Indigenous artists, as well as those from diverse backgrounds or the deaf and disability communities. Similarly, we look for ways to encourage the art sector that uh, an art sector that reflects gender parity more and more. But while I'm both proud and excited about the work being undertaken in Canada to make space for Indigenous and other historically marginalized artists, I don't want to give the false impression that the divides between peoples in Canada have been entirely healed through the arts. It's not the case, it will take time. Notably, our country continues to engage in a broad conversation about cultural appropriation largely in connection to Indigenous representations in the performing arts. The Canada Council for the Arts is committed to respecting and honoring the right of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people of our land to cultural sovereignty. At the same time, there had been much confusion in the wider sector ecology about what this means. Artists in the mainstream expressed concern about their freedom of artistic expression. There's a discussion right now happening in Canada on how you respect the sovereignty, for instance, of uh, indigenous people and how you respect the need for artistic freedom. And it's sometimes a very complex discussion, a very challenging discussion, because a lot of artists, white artists, have a definition of what artistic freedom is that is very, very close to the perpetuation of privilege. And uh, that conversation that, that is growing in importance in Canada will not stop because not only the indigenous artists, but artists from different backgrounds, different minorities in our country are now saying more and more loudly that if we want a vibrant art scene, that art scene needs to present and represent and not acknowledge differences that are in that exist in the real world and need to give space for people to tell their own story stories on their own terms as opposed to being presented through the lens of a of a way of doing arts that is very eurocentric or that is very traditional, or that is very, uh, in fact, the perspective of dominant people uh, about everybody else. Having said this, it is important, I think, that the art should not be instrumentalized by those of us funding, producing, or presenting artistic work. Artists need independence to explore the issues and ideas that matter to them. Instead, I guess the point for all of us as funders, programmers, or presenters is to provide the artists with the support and the space they need to autonomously, autonomously direct these conversations. We do, however, have an important role to play in advocating to leaders in the, within the art sector and in the other sectors uh, about the power and the responsibility of the arts. The very great French uh, writer Victor Hugo used to uh, repeat that everything that grows freedom grows responsibility. 
one doesn't go without the other. So we, we think that discussion about art is, has to be more and more a discussion about values, about public values, about and, and, and disconnecting the discussion between arts and the discussion around public values is very, very dangerous because it will only perpetuate the gap between the art sector and the rest of the society, a gap that never stopped to grow last uh, the, the, all, all over the last 50 years certainly in our country so it's very clear uh, that uh, we we need to for us that we need to kind of uh, reframe the discussion about the importance of the art and society and this is why when we organized that summit of the america last may we invited the un special rapporteur karima benun and she made a, she was the opening speaker, and she made a speech defining cultural rights as human rights. So explaining that those rights, those cultural rights, are not disconnected of the human rights, and they have the same importance, and they carry for the people who believe in those rights the same responsibility of integrity, of authenticity, of of. Uh, so, and uh, she, she was saying that the human rights agenda is an example of where we might bring the art sector more strongly to the table and that there are many, many more areas where we need to consider. I think that as we uncover these new opportunities, we will be surprised that we did not think of them sooner. The arts belong in almost any conversation that has to do with making our society more cohesive, more inclusive. I just want to finish by saying that uh, it is imperative that those of us in the arts, that we work together above and beyond, beyond the, the borders that divide us. We may be smaller players in our respective countries, but together across the world, we are a critical mass that can get the attention to, of key decisions makers in our countries and around the world. This was the idea behind the America's Cultural Summit, where we brought those delegates coming from all these different countries. And together, we drafted a call to action with a view to first, promote value of arts and culture in public life. Second, advance the idea of cultural rights, foster inclusive societies, embrace exchanges between peoples in the American re America's region, acknowledge the rights of indigenous people, and finally cultivate diversity of cultural expressions. In an era of strengthening borders, strengthened borders, increased nationalism and isol isolationism, this collective statement signals the unique position of the arts. We're ready to work together above and beyond our borders to have a real impact on the world. And it is an affirming, optimistic way of looking at the world today. And why shouldn't we take this approach? All of us already have a deep understanding of the power of the arts, I think. Now is the moment for us to unite in a commitment to unleash this power throughout our respective society and around the world. And this is why we believe in networks like ArtsLink and other networks that we're very active in. And we believe that all those gatherings are important because more than ever, the like-minded people can really make a difference if they come with ideas that are bold, that are strong. And if we uh, spend more time to discuss those ideas with the people outside of our sector. So this is my communication for today. I thank you very much. Uh, Simon, uh, thank you so much. We hope you can come to New York soon. We need your perception and powerful advocacy here. Please come I, I soon. Hope, I, I hope the same, and, and, I, and, and I, I'm committed to do it. I think, again, the fact that uh, we are in this very, very unique position of, uh, of having the trust of our government and having more resources than ever 
I think for us it's a it's a complete moment of reinvention, and uh, maybe uh, we have something to uh, to communicate about the importance of that reinvention and the need for not repeating over and over the same ideas and the same words and the same recipes. Exactly. And we're looking for more exchanges with everybody around the world to understand their context and see how we come with plans and ideas that will really lead uh, the future. Simon, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. <laughs> A bientôt. to start but my fellow panelists yes hello everybody I am going to set my stopwatch for 40 minutes instead of 50 minutes so we are a go at 40 minutes um, my name is Kathy Edwards I am the director of the New England Foundation for the Arts which is headquartered in Boston works in New England around the country and internationally thank you Simon for the invitation to join you here today Thank you for all of you. It's been an incredibly inspiring day and so fantastic to hear from some of the current ArtsLink fellows as well. Um, I'll be candid. I accepted this invitation in part because early in my career, I had some amazingly deeply influential opportunities as a result of ArtsLink. And that was the opportunity to host three different ArtsLink fellows. Uh, when I was at Dance Theater Workshop, I learned so much from those individuals. And I think I also learned, honestly, how to be a host and in an international context, truly, of reciprocity. Um, so I owe a lot to the program, and it's a way to pay it forward just a tiny bit. I'm excited to moderate a discussion of four brilliant women. Um, their bios are in your program, but super briefly, I'm going to give you like one sentence on each of them. Um, and I'm going out, well, no, I'm going to go in order of where they're sitting. We have Zeba Rahman, a senior program officer for the Building Bridges program of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, who also has a storied career as a producer of complex arts initiatives and projects, both in the US and internationally. Next to Zeba, Michelle Coffey. Michelle is the director of the Lambent Foundation and an experienced philanthropist who has focused on a number of arenas, including health and justice and human rights, as well as arts and culture. Next to Michelle is Rashida Bumbre, who's a senior program manager of the Arts Exchange, the Open Society Foundation's Global Arts for Social Justice Initiative. I am a dance lover first and foremost, so I'm also going to share that she's an accomplished choreographer as well as curator. And um, next to Rashida, Barbara Lanciers, who might need no introduction here, the director of the Trust for Mutual Understanding, a longtime supporter of international exchange related to the arts and to the environment, and a theater artist in her own right. Um, we're here today to share with you our experience working as funders with an international commitment. What are the principles of our work? Why do we engage actively with international work? Uh, Zeba said to me last week when we were on a planning phone call, the why of this work is clear. It's the how of this work that keeps us up at night, which I... I think is really true, and we certainly just heard a really beautiful statement from Simone Bro about the why of international exchange. Um, from my own perspective at NIFA, we invest in international collaboration and understanding because it is so closely connected to, it is the same as our belief in equity and access to culture for all people. 
and it is really at the heart of our core values that artists and cultural production are essential to a thriving and open society. We also invest as art in artists and cultural workers as leaders, and like all humans, they benefit from the learning new perspective and relationships they develop when they engage in global conversations. And as others have said so eloquently today, artists are leaders who contribute uniquely to building cultural citizenship, sharing and exchanging stories, building participation and inclusion, uh, connecting us to being more human and more innovative. At NEFA this year, we've just supported five months of international US residencies for artistic ensembles from Ukraine and Egypt under the auspices of the Center Stage program. I'm so glad Nina showed a few photographs in her presentation. This is a program that we produce with support from the US Department of State. Um, so that's it for my introduction, and we are going to, uh, as I said, we'll shorten this discussion a little bit. We have 35 minutes to hear from our panelists, and um, I'm going to start by asking each of you to share maybe the most innovative and exciting project that you are currently working on in your portfolio that gives you the most hope in terms of what you're doing in your international exchange work. Um, and if you speak for five minutes each, I think that will give you enough time to not only share some specifics about this project and initiative, but to talk about why you designed it and what the outcomes are that you hope to see. Seva, will you start us off? Absolutely. Um, I had a whole thing written, but I'm going to um, nix that and just talk <laughs> extemporaneously to tell you that the Building Bridges program, um, which is housed under the Dars Duke Charitable Foundation, is focused on um, supporting projects of organizations here in the US. We're a national funder um, that build connections and understandings between American Muslims and the broader non-Muslim community. Um, so we may be the outlier here in terms of actual work, but what our uh, grantees do is actually um, engage artists that are based internationally. Um, so, so that's us. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about one particular uh, grantee uh, in Minneapolis called the Cedar Cultural Center. And the Cedar Cultural Center is a mid-sized concept presenting organization that lives in the middle of Little Mogadishu, the Cedar Riverside community, which is where the largest Somali diaspora refugee um, community lives. Um, and um, the CEDA decided that it was going to focus on um, Somali music as, and center their project of connecting with, um, connecting the two communities, Somali and non-Somali, in this area, in this neighborhood. So they partnered with Augsburg College, which is a small private institution. Um, and they began on the planning phase, but they realized very quickly that um, they could find vocalists in the diaspora, Somali vocalists, but they couldn't find practicing musicians. And the reason for that is that with decades of civil war and the banning of um, music in Somalia, uh, many of the musicians had either abandoned their practice um, or had been uh, harassed or worse um, and had just stopped. So <laughs> the CEDA found that they had this um, grant and they couldn't proceed. So their academic partner, Augsburg College, um, uh, you know, their um, music professor, the head of the music department, decided that he was going to learn Somali music. And then because it's an oral tradition, that he was going to notate it and then teach it to a handful of students at Augsburg College um, and join with some musicians who would stop their practice um, in the Cedar Riverside community and create a house band, the backing band. And then, and then they would invite the vocalists um, from the diaspora. And that's how it started. And it became an incredible project because 
um, a lot of the, um, the concerts were live streamed into refugee camps um, that uh, around the world where the um, Somali um, diaspora was um, clustered. And um, it was really, um, I, I was very touched by one of the presentations. Um, one of the fellows, uh, Atling fellows, talked about fragmentation um, and um, trauma and um, collective memory. And what these concerts did was really um, invite the diaspora to um, remind them of who they are and um, to empower them. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Shall I jump next? Great. Um, maybe I should provide a little bit of context about Lambent Foundation, and then I'll speak about what is exciting me now. Um, so Lambent funds in three specific areas, New York, New Orleans, and Nairobi. Um, New Orleans, uh, New York because it's our home. I work with one individual donor, so there's a lot more freedom and liberation and experimentation than with other um, funding institutions. Um, so New York is our home, New Orleans. Uh, we wanted to do a national work, but I didn't want to build or play, keep money with inside the foundation. I always think you have to move money as fast as you can before we get caught. <laughs> so we keep it really small. Um, but we chose New Orleans uh, for two reasons. Art and culture is infused in the daily fabric, so there wasn't any justification that we needed to do with others. And because there are very few philanthropic dollars that go below the Mason-Dixon line uh, that acknowledges the South. And so it was a political statement for us with that. Um, we were excited about the conversation, but we realized that we couldn't really have a national dialogue without a global context. So that's why we selected Nairobi. And one of the reasons for Nairobi is that the states has a better understanding of a, a West African aesthetic signature and not a lot from East Africa. And East Africa is so vibrant in terms of an Indian, Arabic, and African connotation mixture. So that's how we get to have fun. Um, I'm excited, I, I'm totally moved every day by our partners, but I'm excited by the disruption of our own practice. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to actually talk about philanthropic practice instead of some of our grantee partners, if you guys don't mind. And um, we're disrupting things a little bit. Um, we are questioning uh, that we don't think money is the most important thing, that we're leaving so much on the table if we're only focusing on the grant making. So spending much more time thinking about what influence might we have with our sector, um, what other relationships that we can illuminate and foster. Um, and so I think that's why I was invited on this panel. Um, we really think about network theory as our practice. So one of the things that we've done is um, increased the amount of money that we give to um, core grantee partners over more significant um, years and that we make this general operating support and that we've done away with proposals and reports and that we're recognizing that this is actually a mutual agreement and so we're spending a lot more time thinking in, in conversation with the leadership of the organization that includes board members so that we collectively hold the intention of the four years of how we're working together um, yeah, so we're, and this is all being made up as we go, um, and so we're practicing this out. Um, what uh, excites me the most is a relationship with a um, philanthropic partner from the Netherlands. So we have been intentional about a relationship with Dune Foundation, and Dune Foundation um, has been a significant funder beyond, behind a network called the Arts Collaboratory which is about 32 uh, arts-centered organizations from the global south. And the relationship between Lambent and Dune has allowed Lambent to peer in, almost like a fly on the wall, to see how a network across multiple continents and different sizes 
and different languages um, really build a collective community with hopes that Lambent's community, if we can organize it and uh, if we can organize it, can stand alongside in solidarity and have some intersecting touch points along the way. Um, and what I'm appreciative of the partnership with Dune Foundation and Lambent are just the values that we're leading our work with. And so this idea of mutual accountability um, between the funder and grantee partner and the different foundation, the two different foundations that are coming together, the ideal of solidarity, what does solidarity look like with a philanthropic practice, um, that local relevance is really critical and important. So the New York or US lens is not the only lens that we are leading through. So how does one learn um, and listen better? Mo actually, I would say listen. And this ideal of openness and transparency, which is an, a challenging thing within philanthropy, especially when dealing with wealth. Um, but we're willing to try it. So I wanted to offer that um, as what is exciting me without it looking egocentric. Hi. <laughs> so it's really exciting for me to be on this panel. One, because um, I've been on the receiving end. And when I worked at the kitchen, we got a grant from the Lambert Foundation. So um, it's just, you know, really thrilling as someone who's potentially. Um, you know, thinking about how to continue to complicate your relationship with philanthropy, but also I'm only three years in. So um, the Arts Exchange is a relatively new initiative at the Open Society Foundations, which historically has had quite a schizophrenic relationship with arts in general. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of based on the fact that many people, um, you know, that the foundation was founded by George Soros and founded, you know, really thinking about um, how to avoid the world turning back the way it has now, right? And and sort of the linkage between propaganda and fascism. So I think there's been a sort of anxiety around, you know, how do we support artists without um, sort of really telling people what to think? And so, you know, we've had to, um, complicated, which is really simple for people who are Im immersed in the arts to sort of dispel that, but it, it's been um, a little bit of a hurdle. So hopefully we're beyond that moment um, now, but really um, we exist to actually support and encourage our colleagues who are doing arts philanthropy, who are doing social justice and, and um, uh, human rights philanthropy throughout uh, many global contexts to include artists and arts organizations in their strategies. Um, so that is very much an internal project. Um, but one of the things that has been exciting about that is we actually do have the opportunity to do um, some direct grant making and that has uh, materialized as the Soros Arts Fellowship, um, which this is the very first um, cohort of the Soros Arts Fellowship. They are about 10 months into an 18 month fellowship. Um, and it really was developed through a posture of deep listening to artists around many global contexts about what kind of support would actually allow them to think deeply about their local context. Um, and it was really developed around this idea of art, public space, and closing societies. And sort of, you know, what are um, the various conditions that artists are working under and how can philanthropy actually be supportive of that? Um, and also uh, not be um, putting them in, in further danger. So we have a group of eight artists. Um, I'll just sort of mention the context that they're working. Um, Faustin Lynn Likula, who um, you know, has a history with many of us in New York, including Simon Dove, um, is, is from the DRC. And we know him because he is sort of a, 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 a choreographic hero and superstar, especially um, in New York and many European contexts. Um, but you know, thinking about what does it actually mean for him to have the time, space, resources to actually focus on a local project, um, and you know, many artists, as we know, that are working in, in closing contexts or closed contexts, uh, become the institution, right? And so, in the case of Fausten, he's developed. 
um, you know, residency space. Um, and the project that he's doing for the fellowship is really a film. It's a citizen film about a man who was sort of encouraged by two women in Kailisha in his town to run for a public office. Um, and the reason they did that was really because they wanted to get one person out of poverty. Uh, not that they had a lot of confidence in what it would mean for this person to be, um, you know, an elected official. Um, so it really sort of talks about the sort of uh, crossroads of hope and despair in many ways and sort of, um, you know, the other thing that's really amazing about his kind of practice is that he's also teaching people along the way. Um, like I said, building an institution. And so how do, you know, how do you create a contemporary dance company? You teach people contemporary dance. So how do you make a film um, in that kind of context, teaching people filmmaking while he's learning it himself? Um, so that's just one example. Um, and we have um, two, four other fellows in Africa, Nana Ofriada Ayim in Ghana, um, and Hassan Darcy and Laila Hida in Morocco. Um, we have Guy Regis Jr. in Haiti, um, Laurie Joe Reynolds in Chicago. Um, well, I'm leaving people out. Uh, but anyway, it's a quite diverse group of eight artists. Um, Khalid Albea, who is a Sudanese political cartoonist living in exile in Copenhagen. Um, but really sort of thinking about how do we create a network for those artists and also support them. So they get an $80,000 fellowship over 18 months to make an ambitiously scaled um, public art project or a project that engages the public. And we thought about this idea of public space really from the lens of um, artists that we talked to in a gathering that we organized called the OSF Arts Forum, which was in Morocco in 2017. And it was around this concept of art, public space, and closing societies. And a lot of what we heard was really that safety and security was one of the most important um, things that artists were concerned with. Um, and so within that, we wanted to sort of explore, well, what does it mean to work in exile? What does it mean to have an underground practice um, like the Belarus Free Theater, for example, uh, and what does it mean to, um, you know, really need peers when you're working in that kind of deep isolation. And so this fellowship is really uh, developed to sort of um, construct that kind of circle around a small group of artists over 18 months. And then as it grows this year, the um, fellows will be focusing on art, migration, and public space. Um, that that community will continue to grow. So that's the most exciting thing that I'm working on. Thank you. Um, something that I am hearing a lot from all of you is listening and, and deep listening. And I, that resonates with me because uh, the thing that excites me the most about uh, what I get to do at the Trust for Mutual Understanding is listen to grantees. Um, so, so to give you just a little bit of context of, of who we are, um, we're uh, a, a small, small but mighty foundation. Uh, we were started in 1985 by an anonymous member of the Rockefeller family. And we fund arts and environmental exchanges uh, in 30 countries that encompass Central, Eastern, Southeastern Europe, Central Asia, the Baltic States, the Caucasus, Mongolia, Russia, and the United States. So we have a, a wide, <laughs> wide geographic purview and something that is collectively happening uh, across the board. So I'll talk about the region. I'll say the region, and what I'm talking about are, are those parts of the world that I just mentioned. Um, that's our geographic region. There's a collective anxiety that's happening right now, and it, and it means that we have to do a lot of really deep listening. Um, and, and we have to, uh, in many ways, be a thought partner, not a micromanager, but maybe a, a reflector back. Um, so one way that we've been deeply listening and trying to be responsive to that listening is that, um, particularly for our grantees in the region, the part of the world that I'm talking about, um, you know, we only have four staff people. Um, we only had three staff people. And uh, we cover such a huge geographic territory that we felt like, you know, we, the three of us were on airplanes all the time, which is, which is wonderful and important. Um, but we really felt like we needed a presence closer to the part of the world where we work. So we hired a regional representative, and she's now based in Berlin. Um, and we have a small office for her in Berlin that we rent at the Aspen Institute, Germany. And they've become a very great partner of ours. 
And um, that's been important for us because we have access also to their facilities. So we are able to uh, convene in a way that uh, we are being constantly asked to do because we have the privilege of sitting in a place where uh, we can see trends that are happening here in the, un in the United States that are reflective of trends that are happening in the part of the world where you work. And the grantees keep asking us, please, we want to talk to each other. You guys are nice as staff people, but we really want to be in the room with each other. We really want to talk to each other. We're all in similar situations now, and, and we need uh, time and space to, to, to strategize and to just be in solidarity. Um, so that is something that uh, is exciting. And also, just to touch on a little bit, Michelle, what you were saying is financial support is obviously really, really, really important. But we're also trying to look at what are forms of non-financial support and advocacy that we can provide? So one of those is new for us. It's called Grantee Voices. It's a newsletter, essentially. But it's um, uh, we are sort of obsessed with Bomb Magazine and the interview structure of Bomb. So uh, we ask grantees to interview each other, and then we transcribe and, and edit those interviews. Um, and uh, Ariola just participated in one of those. That's coming out soon, I promise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, so um, th th that's really about uh, raising awareness and um, trying to, to introduce people and ideas and practices to, to a wider audience. And then we're also uh, curating, I guess is the right word. I don't know. We're having more public events at our office. Um, and that is, you know, because we grant making the arts and the environmental sphere, there's so much intersection between those. Um, and we are trying to uh, draw artists and environmentalists together to, to learn across disciplines and also just to, to, to raise awareness um, for people that are coming from um, really difficult, challenging situations and need a lifeline and networking is so important. So we're trying to provide that sort of informal networking too. Thank you all. So appreciate those answers. Um, I'm going to ask one question, then if we have a few minutes, we'll open it up to everyone. I was going to ask you all where you sort of thought some of the biggest opportunities lay that maybe, you know, are sort of um, that any number of, of folks in this ecosystem system could step into, and also what you thought the biggest challenges were to working internationally right now. Some opportunities surfaced just among you already convening grantees, thinking about ways to uh, provide critical non-financial support um, and also solidarity networks, uh, listening to grantees. But throw some other opportunities out there. And also, if each of you could share, like, this is the big risk slash challenge that keeps me, keeps me up at night. Um, Seba, can we start with you again? Um, the biggest risk, I'll start with that, is um, what has already been touched upon, which is physical risk. Um, I, it does keep me up at night. I worry about uh, grantees doing this very brave work. I worry about um, my colleagues at the foundation and the risk that I am opening them up to. I worry about um, scaling the projects, uh, this wonderful work that our grantees do, um, and putting at risk the the communities that they that participate in the project. So um, I'm worried a lot, but <laughs> at the same time, in this um, very risky but rather fluid uh, era that we're in, there's also great opportunity. And one of the things that we do, that we made a decision to do in the program is to provide strategic communication support by engaging uh, a, communi a communications company that actually um, is the consultant to each grantee for the life of the grant period. So um, it teaches strategic messaging. Um, and it's not just about writing press, uh, press releases. That, that uh, they can do very well, but actually strategic messaging and ways in which to amplify, amplify their stories and to use the tools um, of uh, larger networks to reach across the arts audience, the, the, uh, the choir as it were. And another thing that we're doing is that inspired by our grantees and the communication support, the program itself, uh, our staff of 1.7 uh, people, <laughs> 
What's I know. A, what's no, no. a point seven person? <laughs> it's um, um, our program associate who's um, who is split. Yes, um, with another department. She shared um, that we um, have actually taken on um, the production with a production company of two videos, two films, two short films that are shareable, and one of them. Um, which is called The Secret History of Muslims in America, um, is an animation, and it's going to premiere on a rather large platform in early December. So um, this is not a boast, but it's actually to say that um, we're finding subversive ways, we're sort of ideas are like water. They just flow over constraints, which is the beauty of exchanges, right? and that indomitable human spirit that will be subversive and just um, go around or over or under constraints. Um, that we see ourselves as advocates for the work, for our grantees. Yes, we bring the funding piece, but we also bring our ideas and we, we, use, we hope to use these videos as a way to really amplify our grantees' um, voices and their work and reach communities, especially in that purple zone. Um, I'm not doing this, but I'm excited by this moment of intersectionality. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we were fighting for eight to 10 years, kind of building where we could have the intersection of art and culture and justice issues, and finally criminal justice reform, environment, thanks to TMU, reproductive rights, everyone is now recognizing the power and the necessity of artists and cultural makers at the forefront alongside of organizers. So that's my optimistic excitement. Um, I'm fearful of the art market and its consumption. I have no idea how to address that. And I'm scared by um, the US lens and our limitations around race and gender normative uh, realities and that dominating um, how w we continue to engage in the world and it's destructive. Um, afraid of, I feel like it's a little bit of what you all have both said. One, um, just continuing to be in this market driven extractive uh, way of interacting with artists. Um, and just on a personal level, two very good friends of mine that are artists passed away in the past week, under 50 years old. Oh, wow. And I really attribute it to just, yeah, just like a Basquiat situation, you know, where like, how much more can we take from one person? Um, and in order to engage and be successful, which they both were prolific, um, but it, what, is that, what is the toll that that actually takes on humanity at large, really, you know? individuals but also humanity so really th really thinking about how do we develop the different kind of relationship with cultural production um, that is also about surrounding people with support surrounding people with resources and not just monetary resources but also thinking about them as uh, full people so I feel like that's sort of core to why I even do this work uh, but it's it's um, you know really um, it makes me feel ashamed to actually be a part of the art world sometimes, you know? Um, and so I'm really thankful, similar to what you're saying, that we are coming around to a different political reality. And sometimes I say, like, maybe the silver lining of the global rise of fascism is that we realize that all of us have to participate in um, freedom fighting. All of us have to participate in um, sort of coming together on, on the sort of reality of where we could go, uh, which is why I think this kind of exchange is so important. And we were um, able to bring the Belarus Free Theater to do a production in our office, which is appropriate because they're always working in garages and in you know these contexts where um, you know audiences can sort of sneak in to see this work. But it really was about how do we have a moment of dystopic visioning to see where we are going, right? So that we can be conscious enough to um, either pump the brakes or get ahead of that and um, really fight on behalf of, of freedom of expression and also on behalf of artists 
um, who are doing this kind of brave work and who are putting themselves on the very front lines of um, this kind of work. So I feel like I'm in this moment of, of both um, terror and inspiration. I think there's opportunity and disruption. Um, I think that this global climate that we're living in right now, um, we're all, everything is so interconnected and there's actually uh, t time and space to be disrupted. We're all disrupted um, at, at the current moment and it, and it forces us to reach out for each other. Um, it, it forces us to work collaboratively, I think more, um, listen more deeply um, and to, um, you know, I, I think as foundation staff people, we are disrupted from our usual way of thinking about things and, and our boxes that we get in and our assumptions that we make. Um, we have to think more flexibly. We have to think more uh, more um, fluidly. Um, and uh, I think for, for uh, particularly for our grantees, we're seeing intersectionality in the sense of we're seeing people reach out for each other and talk to each other across disciplines, across geographic borders, across cultural borders. There's a, again, the word solidarity keeps coming up, but there's a solidarity there that is um, uniting people in a way that I, uh, I have, I've been at the Trust for Mutual Understanding 10 years and I haven't seen it like this before. On the other hand, I haven't seen it like this before. And um, the thing that keeps me up at night are faces, people's faces. Um, people's stories, people that I care about, people that I've known for a very long time. This part of the world where, where we work at the Trust for Mutual Understanding is very dear to me. I'm half Hungarian, my family lives in Hungary. The situation there is very, very difficult. So it's not just my family, it's our grantees. It's, it's the staff, it's my, my colleagues. Like you said, Zeb, I, I worry about them when they travel. Um, I make them um, constantly check in with me when they're traveling. I'm constantly checking in with them. Um, so th this is a really uh, difficult time. And I think when you care and are open-hearted, uh, it's gonna keep you up at night right now. Simon, it's 4.50, which is when we were supposed to end. Shall we? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take some questions and because our time is so short and we'd love to get a few questions in, I'm just gonna ask you to try really hard to ask your question in 15 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, raise your hand if you have a question and we will take it. Shy, shy audience. We've answered all, yes. Thank you. Um, maybe it's not a good question you can actually answer right now, but how are you incorporating this reality that we have 12 years left <laughs> in your work? Yeah, can I, can I, can I jump yeah. for a sec? So um, the reality of the 12 years left is, is very prominent in our work because we're actually, we're, we're making, we're, we're involved in environmental grant making. So we actually, uh, the field scientists that are out in the Arctic and watching the ice melt are coming in and giving us reports and showing us photos and uh, showing us videos of what they're seeing. Um, so we are trying to balance our grant making in the sense of, um, for a long time we've been thinking about it, there's the arts and there's the environment. And we're trying not to think about it that way so much anymore. And for a long time it was, well, 70% of our grant making is in the arts and 30% is in the environment. And now it's, um, okay, well, 60-40, and we're working toward 50-50, but really what we're just trying to work toward is, um, it's not, I'm not, impact is not the word because we're a foundation that doesn't believe in measuring impact, um, which I know is a pretty rare thing, but um, urgency. Urgency and working and working together and working across sectors to tell the story because there's so much scientific data that we have, but those stories aren't being told in a way that's motivating people, particularly lawmakers. So, th that's. I would love to answer that. Um, um, we're working with a question, and a uh, question was posed to us by our network theory coach, and he asked. Um, what ancestor are we in training to be? 
and it, it really rocked us. And so it's forcing us to think about our own selves, how we love, how we live, and our work, generations ahead, and to find those characteristics and hone on those right now. And so, yeah, I think it's important for all of us to think about um, what are we in training for? What are the ancestral qualities that we are wanting to leave with our children and grandchildren? I don't think we can end any better than that. So yeah. oh, no, there's I'm going to give you back your, your, your time. There's, there's um, or do we have one more question? Okay. Yeah, 15 seconds or less. Yeah. Hi, I'm Claude Grinitsky. I'm the president of, of the Watermill Foundation. And uh, the Watermill Center, we've had issues, obviously, of artists who've had visas denied. And so do you find that these very important foundations that you represent, you're able to lobby the State Department or the embassies, or does it not affect anything ever? Because I saw Nina Murray was here earlier. Uh, yes. Uh, can, can you do some, I mean, is it possible for you to have some sort of sway? <laughs> Anybody want to take that? Uh, I, I would like to, to answer. Um, I'd like to give you an example of what one of our grantees did. Uh, it's Georgetown University, and they had a project with Syrian women refugees, and they were opening that season with this um, theater piece, and they didn't get their visas. So what they did is that they decided to Skype in um, the, the actors, the, the, um, the Syrian refugee ladies from uh, Jordan, from their refugee camp. Um, and have the audience um, in the theater. And so um, they talked about the project and the difficulties and the challenges. And then one of the um, ladies asked why their visa was denied. And in the audience, I don't know if you were there that day, Nina, but in the audience was a State Department person, a representative. Um, and uh, the facilitator of the conversation turned to the, to the State Department rep and said, Please go ahead and answer the question. And uh, live, they, this person said it was just a bad day. So uh, <laughs> that can mean many things. But um, that was one kind of uh, moment in which um, uh, this art center um, you know, actually turned a really uh, you know, impossible situation, but basically um, not having uh, the work open to a conversation which got uh, actually a lot more engagement, not just with the audience, but in terms of media and attention uh, much more broadly in different um, communities beyond just the art space. Taking my cue from you, Simon, because oh, Nina, do you want to answer? Yes. Into the scrum, which is also live, there's no tougher job than answering consular questions on live stream. <laughs> I applaud Zenab and your group that found this solution. It is difficult to operate within the constraints that the immigration law puts on us overseas. You are unlikely ever to get the answer about why something happened because there is legal protection for the adjudicator. The protection is there for their safety and also for the safety of the public. All that said, work with us early, get in touch with us. There's, a <laughs> There's my retired colleague there in the audience as well. Especially if you're working with people, with nations that, with states that are sort of in the public view and in the political public view, get in touch with us early, get in touch with the embassy, and have a plan B. And also, I know there is an ongoing effort uh, within, with NEA, so it is also important to advocate domestically. This is another thing that we cannot do. We are an executive agency in terms of managing immigration <coughs> and in that regard we do not advocate for changes in policy we implement the policy we rely on you to tell our lawmakers what is necessary 
So please do that. Shall we? Thank you so much. This was a fantastic discussion. And thanks to all of you. You are so inspiring, those we've heard from on stage, and just our friends and colleagues in the audience. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anna Ziapshipa. I'm from Georgia, and uh, Zoya. Uh, hi, I'm Zoya Falkova. I'm from Kazakhstan. And we have an uh, opportunity to speak about the archives, actually, which is such a broad topic, and, but we will try to condense it somehow and make it personal. <laughs> so to refer Ilya Kabakov's word about his work named The Man Who Never Threw Anything Away, I'm the woman who never throws uh, anything away somehow, <laughs> so I'm a collector. So I would like to refer to several images which inspire my work, uh, which inspired um, the work that I'm doing with the archives. And oh yeah, did something happen with that? <laughs> yeah. So I would refer with two images that were very important images to me. So the first one is. Um, destroyed archive in Abkhazia. And Abkhazia is a breakaway territory which exists, unrecognized state which exists um, in neighboring Georgia. And um, it was part of the Georgia and it was part of the Georgia for ages. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, Abkhazians decided to go independent as well. And I'm partly from Abkhazia, but living in Georgia. Uh, so somehow this image deconstructing, uh, destroying the Abkhazian archive and leaving these people without any collective memory somehow was really striking image for me because it happened in 1992 and all this memory were lost, was lost because of the war and these people are left These people are left without any memory. So somehow this image was very important image uh, because I never been to Abkhazia after, after the war, like 25 years. But uh, in 2013, I had the opportunity to uh, cross the border and go to my home and uh, see the people there who are living there without any family albums, any personal histories, and any collective histories. So somehow it was inspiration for me to reconstruct the archive virtually. So my project was connected to that destroyed archive and uh, how, it, how it is possible using new technologies and new media to reconstruct that uh, destroyed uh, collective memory. I tried to find some different uh, documents, visual forms of the archive, music and put it online. So um, this is the, my possibility to support part of my identity to reconstruct their memories. The, another image that I would like to refer is a film image from the Jean-Gabriel Perriot film, even if she had been a criminal, which is uh, another importance of the archive nowadays. Actually, it's kind of a personification of the history and uh, how the uh, history could be read in different side, how the history can have a um, different voice and second chance to read. So that image was very important also to refer, it refers to my works as well somehow, and I tried to also use the official archives and somehow personalize that work, uh, that archive in my, in my work, in my films and my projects. Uh, 
So I would say a word about the future of the archives, and I meant that digitalization of the archives is also very important, but that's not also the safe place also to keep all these memories and documents. So, but it's a, it's a chance also to have that possibility to keep them. But to uh, also to curate another time, Ilya Kabakov's words about the archives, I think it's a very important thing about speaking about the future of the archives. It also continuously generates something. This is where some kinds of shoots come from, new projects, ideas, a certain enthusiasm arises, hopes for the rebirth of something new. So I think the future use the archive can refer to that word. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Zoya Falkova from Kazakhstan, and I want to use the microphone time to thank everyone who made this possible, this program of CCR Sling that was an amazing time. And I also will start, I will also start with the, uh, I will also start with the damaged archives. But uh, with the archives which were destroyed not because of the war, or something like that, but because of ignorance and attempts to erase the history just because nothing else comes up. So that, that is the images from uh, the film, the movie I found on the street after they destroyed, I don't know who, uh, destroyed the railways museum in Almaty, my hometown. And uh, it spent this movie spent about a couple of years on the street, and it was damaged, but partly survived. And I scanned it uh, frame by frame, and I got this kind of images reminding you about Andy Warhol. And there are some people I don't know who, I don't know what kind of what kind of movie that was, but it it looks like a river of the time swallowing them, and therefore. I consider that uh, this is not the, the archive which fixing the time uh, when this archive was made, but this is the archive which includes the history of the archive itself. So this is a double narrative. The narrative of the Soviet time when this documentary movie is something about the trains uh, were created and plus the time when it, w it was destroyed, plus the attempts of the people who thrown the all the archive of the museum just to the street. And uh, I think that this uh, kind of memory is also uh, important and that's how we can use it, uh, reflect it without adding nothing. Like I added color here just because it needed for the exhibition. But this is original color and nothing else. And this is already double archive and the art which created by all the circumstances. Or sometimes we need the archive of something which doesn't exist. There is a needs or silence or kind of problem no one talks about. And as an artist, I'm using the post-truth um, methodology like the news, propaganda, etc. they're using, and I creating the fake archives. So this is the documentary and uh, of the meeting which never existed. This, uh, we have the third of the uh, part of the country which are not ethnically Kazakhs, but all our government program, they are based on Kazakh tra national traditions and no one talks about more than 100 nationalities else living in Kazakhstan, so, oops. Yeah, so uh, that was a slogan. If someone's understand Russian, that sounds very funny. It's colonized, colonized, but have never colonized through. It's uh, on, on, on a gray, on a gray background and this three lights, and then the background you can see the cupola of the foundation of our president, which stays as a president for more than thirty years already. So yeah, we have our Trump who never know, knows when he quits. And uh, he once he said that we, need, we, we have zero modern museums in our country. In whole country, we have a uh, space launching station, but we don't have a uh, modern art museum. We have little section in National Museum, but this is kind of toothless one. 
And uh, once our president said what we need mu more museums and I created one. So I found this hut, an abandoned area, and I created the museum of, I uh, of modern art, idol are no entry. So there is no entry. Um, but you can see that the shape is very modernistic. Like this kind of window, this shape, not this shitty one, but the shape could be Le Corbusier, all this, this kind of shape could be done by Miss Van der Rohe, but it's kind of, you know, ready-made stuff. And I created that uh, art, uh, which fell down like less than in a week. It's already didn't exist because it, 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 uh, it was falling down together with the spray. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and there is no entry, nothing is inside, but because we don't have uh, any any space for m for real contemporary art in, in the country. So, and this is a kind of archive, or you when you're archiving the situation, when you're making the fake archive or fake archive, right? And uh, I think that this is uh, that's all. Yeah, that's all. I didn't <laughs> stop. Okay. That's my presentation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and so we we can use this methodology uh, uh, propaganda uses in in art, and this is also very important in archiving the moments, the syst uh, the the speech which which never happened. And uh, so the, f the destroyed archives is the which uh, happened and happened double. And this has never happened, but happened somehow. So the music is merciless. It's <laughs> Sorry, it's time. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. My name is Isabel Galliera, and I'm an art historian. Um, so I teach and I research about socially engaged art practice. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Simon, for the kind invitation. So I'll get right to it. Um, I know we are very um, strict on time. So socially engaged art practice and the institutions that support it have always been relevant. And especially now in the era of the Anthropocene, planetary environmental devastation, starvation, humiliation, and inequity. A vivid image of the crisis of our time is the caravan currently en route from Honduras to the US border, which I'm sure that many of you have heard about in the news. It began on October 13, and is currently around, has currently around 5,000 people, though it is really difficult to know the exact number and includes women, children traveling both by foot and also hitchhiking rides on trucks. Depending on where you are getting your news, people in the caravan are seen as fleeing poverty, gang violence, and persecution. But on the other side, the caravan is also seen as an invasion, as President Trump called it. According to a Washington Post article, Trump also announced that the U.S. would send around 5,000 troops to the border with Mexico to deal with the migrants, whose arrival is rather difficult to estimate. That caravan is outside the U.S., but there is currently one in the U.S., um, which is recently completing the 12-week tour around the U.S., and it's a caravan of the TPS Initiative for Justice that started in August. This caravan consisted consists over 50 TPS holders from countries such as El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti, Nicaragua, Sudan, Nepal, Somalia. And it is at an attempt to save the temporary protected status program that protects over 450,000 people from deportation. Trump announced to terminate this program next year as part of his ongoing attacks against immigrant communities. So while I was following these caravans in the news, I was reminded of the work by Romanian artist Matej Bejenaro, Hungarian artist Miklos Orhard, Scottish artist Dominic Hislop, and Spanish artist Santiago Sierra. I was reminded of all the pertinent social and political issues that have been and are at the core of socially engaged art practice. 
The global penchant toward art as social practice has encompassed modes of art making theorized and discussed internationally since the early 90s as participatory, relational, collaborative, dialogic, community-based, sociopolitical conscious forms of public art. Key writers include Suzanne Lacey, Grant Castor, Claire Bishop, Tom Finkelperl, Nicolas Bourriot, Mion Cohn, Shannon Jackson, Nato Thompson, and many others. Certainly, such practice that conceives art as catalyst for change is not new. It has roots in early forms of avant-garde art, such as constructivism and the Bauhaus, with their goal of, marginal, of merging art and life. For example, in Russia, especially during the peak years between 1917 and the early 1920s, avant-garde artists were invited and supported by the newly installed Bolshevik political regime to take part in the transformation of a predominantly agrarian society into an industrialized socialist economy led by the proletariat. In the US, socially engaged art is rooted in conceptualist work by artists such as Alan Caprow, in the 1970s feminist initiatives that made use of performance and pedagogy as we see in the Holman House led by Miriam Shapiro and Judy Chicago in 1971. And then in the 1970s and 80s with the emergence of new genre public art in the work of Suzanne Lacey. And then the work of Group Material and Martha Rossler at the DR Foundation which follow suit. Socially engaged art is also indebted to the confrontational approach practiced by institutional critique artists such as Andrea Frazier, Hans Hacke, and Fred Wilson, to name just a few. So in my research and teaching, I use the notion of socially engaged art as an umbrella term to include self-organizing institutions, site-specific contemporary forms of art and exhibition making, that unfold in public spaces, primarily urban, but also rural, over longer or shorter periods of time. Some art forms are participatory, meaning they can, no, they can ultimately be realized only through the physical involvement, albeit temporary, of people. Other projects are collaborative, meaning that they emerge from specific ways of working together among diverse individuals. Others combine both participatory and collaborative strategies. The participants and or collaborators in these artistic practices vary from fellow artists, curators and critics to audience members, anonymous passerby in public squares and members of specific marginalized communities such as immigrants. Some projects aim to create harmonious collaborations. Others aim to be antagonistic and confrontational. Nevertheless, these projects are the result of complex negotiation dynamics unfolding among artists, curators, and funding institutions. Despite their varied modes of critique and strategies of engagement, they all share a desire to reclaim public life from current neoliberal ideologies in order to build inclusive public spheres as democratic forms within emerging or declining civil societies. Such goals are especially vital under the pervasive influence of global neoliberalism, supported by increasingly autocratic political regimes throughout the world. To quote uh, historian Vitai Preshoff, the monsters have returned. Revived by political leaders worldwide, such as Trump, Erdogan, Orban, Modi, Maduro. Our contemporary conditions governed by the global neoliberalism emphasis on individual libertarianism have continued to trigger increasing worldwide gaps between the rich and the poor. Environmental degradation, communal and familiar separations, the wild craze for profit accumulation through deregulation and outsourcing of production to third world countries around the globe in order to exploit low manufacturing costs are all sustained by the precarious conditions of the worker. This implies, for example, short term and or part-time part -time jobs, health and pension insecurity, long commutes and global migrations. Neoliberal forces therefore control and organize life through various technologies of power, which Michael Foucault called biopower. There are at the core of global migrations of people determined to re relocate and escape poverty, gang violence, environmental devastation. 
So the migrants are the sacrifice for the failure and successes of neoliberalism, understood as both an ideological construction and an economical order. Immigration has always been a controversial and decisive, divisive political issue. A number of contemporary socially engaged artists have approached it in various ways. So I decided to highlight a few artists. It was a hard choice um, or, or a difficult decision and their works because of their particular ways in which they closely worked with situations and institutions to accomplish their projects, and implicitly because of the questions they raise on the role of art institutions in our times of crisis. When a black man is involved in a dirty deed, the belief of the Italians is that every black man is involved in a dirty deed. The police can come into the market and ask for your document or passport, and you can be deported. What year do you think this was in? 2002, in Italy, and this is James, an immigrant from Nigeria to Italy, describing in an interview with the artist Miklos Erhardt and Dominic Hislop, his experiences with practices of racial profiling that associate race with criminality, performed by the Turin police who considered the open market in Porta Palazzo one of the most difficult zones in the city from a security standpoint, particularly in the Italian context, markers of differential ordering of immigrant groups had been based on a person's national affiliation, physical appearance, or popular stereotypical notions produced and reproduced in the media, or in discussions among Italians. As a result, Bangladeshi immigrants are seen as street vendors. African groups sell handbags. Romanian and Albanian men are viewed as untrustworthy and part of mafia. Writing in 2008, Flavia Stanley argued that the differential treatment of immigrant groups by Italian citizens was motivated by a desire to protect their own European status from and against non-EU citizens. Such informal patterns of everyday interactions have been regulated by Italy's institutionalized restrictive national legislation on immigration, most vividly presented then by the 2002 Bosifini law. Italy's most highly restrictive reform since the fascist period. Such exclusionary measures as those in Italy clearly support the notion of fortress Europe, a term Chris Shore used to indicate the tightening of EU borders against immigrants in the early 2000s. And it was this fortress Europe that Erhard and Hislop wanted to challenge and subvert in their socially engaged work called Reroute. It was created as part of their participation in the Bing Turino International Biennale of Young Artists. It presented the engagement of the artists with 28 recent immigrants in the city of Turin. It developed through a collaborative process that included several meetings and extended over a period of several months, only in part funded by the Biennale organizing institutions. So a bit about the process, the how. First, the artists identified participants by con contacting a number of local organizations. Then, beginning in December of 2001, they met with participants who were invited to trace their own version of the city, a mental map based on their routes and effective responses to specific urban places. The artists gave each participant a blank sheet of white paper with only a dot in the center that symbolized Torino's Porta Nova train station, the main entry point in the city for all immigrants. An interview based on their hand-drawn mental maps immediately followed, and the artists gave each participant a camera in order for them to photograph and illustrate the map with photos of the places. The artists entered in contact with 20 organizations in Turin, serving the needs of the homeless and the immigrants. Once in Turin, the Biennale office connected the artists with a public school where immigrants learned Italian. Following this initial contact, in a rather organic way, the artists continued to establish contacts with local social workers, teachers, political activists, cultural organizations, and support groups for immigrants that were willing to recommend artists to potential participants. Engaging in a self-reflexive production of space, Reroute became a platform for articulating an inclusive form of citizenship based on complex relational processes where temporal and spatial differences were continually neg negotiated between individuals. Through the collection of individual views where each of the self-narrated oral histories became part of the community of singular voices, 
the artist disrupted the exclusionary and essentialist approach to immigrant populations. Similar to Erhard and Hislop, but employing a different collaborative strategy, Matei Begenaro created work that participated in the social political debate on immigration that unfolded at the EU level in the first decades following the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. His two projects, My Arcs Dubai in 2007 and Travel Guide conceived in 2005, illustrated the effects of what writer Subrata Bobby Barnaji called the power of necro-capitalism, which describes the ways in which neoliberalism exercises its power of control by not only allowing and determining people's way of living, but also their modes of dying. In his video, My Arcs Dubai, Begenaro narrates the 1996 tragic death of three Romanian immigrants thrown off board of a Taiwanese transportation ship. At one level, the necro, necro capital is localized in the cumulative circumstances encountered in their country that provoke the three young Romanians to attempt to cross the Atlantic over to Canada by embarking illegally on board the ship and hiding in air-sealed shipping containers. At another level, necropolitical emerges in the unhesitant decision of the ship captain to get rid of the bodies out of fear of losing his job upon public revelation, revelation of dead illegal immigrant bodies on his ship. It is the very condition of legality, of living as a marginalized citizen, as an impoverished European post-communist nation, restricted by a complex web of legal requirements to travel or work in other countries, which contributes to an alienation of life and an acceleration of actual death. In 2000, Etienne Balibar spoke of a European apartheid that exists simultaneously with the notion of European citizenship. It implies that immigrant population on the EU territory, coming most often from African countries and also Eastern Europe, are constituted as inferior in rights and dignity, subject to violent forms of security control and forced to live on the border, neither absolutely inside nor totally outside. Begenaro's travel guide was conceived in 2005 before Romania joined the EU, when its citizens were not able to travel to UK without visa. And because of that sound, I'm gonna skip over the Spanish artist and I'm gonna um, relay my conclusion. So even from these projects, socially engaged artists seek to endanger dialogue on pertinent social and political issues and to try to foster resilient communities. They focus on difference, division, inequality in society. They raise questions on the relation between ethics and aesthetics, on the role of art, the art institution, and art organization in our time. They are process, site, and time-based, and often by the very process of interaction and negotiation with particular community, this is what becomes the art medium. And by its very nature, such art forms are hybrid, cross-disciplinary, and in their aims, they aim to bring forward the uncomfortable and neglected issues of our society. Good afternoon. My name is Guillermo Ochoa, and I'm the International Specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts. It's a pleasure to be here today. My goal for today is to give you a brief overview of the NEA and delve into our international activities portfolio. As an executive agency, sorry. As an executive agency, the president appoints a chairman, and that person is confirmed by the Senate. Marianne Carter has been nominated by President Trump, which is a huge feat because he has um, called for our elimination for the last two years, um, and we're awaiting for her confirmation. Our budget is appropriated by Congress and passed at $155 million for FY18. Now I'd like to show you a brief video on what the NEA does. Industries 
contributing 4.3% to the nation's GDP. That was $698 billion in 2012. The National Endowment for the Arts is America's chief funder and supporter of the arts. As an independent federal agency, the NEA celebrates the arts as a national priority critical to America's future and is investing in arts education and local programs to empower students at all levels. More than anything, the arts provide a space for us to create and express. Through grants given to thousands of nonprofits each year, the NEA helps people in communities across America experience the arts and exercise their creativity. From visual arts to digital arts, opera to jazz, film to literature, theater to dance, to folk and traditional arts, healing arts to arts education, music to design. The NEA supports a broad range of America's artistic expression. Every dollar of funding the NEA awards is matched by up to $7 of additional investment. And we've awarded over $5 billion through the years with a historical commitment to keeping the arts a vital part of our nation. Art helps us understand and express the world, driving creativity and innovation. And NEA-funded programs help transform communities into lively, beautiful, and resilient places with art at the center. We envision a nation where every American benefits from the arts, and every community celebrates its goals and achievements through the arts, strengthening our creative capacity and America's future. Our office does not fund projects directly, but rather we work in partnership with others. Through cooperative initiatives with other funders, the NEA brings the benefit of international exchange to arts organizations, artists, and audiences nationwide. My office increases the recognition of the excellence of US arts around the world and broadens the scope of experience of American artists, thereby enriching the art they create. Through partnerships with other government agencies, such as um, the Department of Education and Cultural Affairs from the State Department, and the private sector, the NEA fosters international creative collaboration by strengthening residency programs of foreign artists in communities across the country. So we work primarily with um, the US's six regional arts organizations, of, with, of which Kathy Edwards is um, the head of NEFA. Um, so that's that. Those are the that's the main um, group that we work with, and um, we give them grants so that they can grant out other um, opportunities that we have for international artists. So, in partnership with Mid Atlantic Arts Foundation, which is in Baltimore, U.S. Artists International provides grants to performers in dance, music, and theater invited to perform at significant international festivals and performing arts markets. Also in partnership with Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, Southern Exposure brings exemplary, contemporary, and traditional performing arts from Latin America to audiences across the United States. Performing Arts Discovery, we work with our regional arts organizations to introduce presenters to US performing artists. So it's a reciprocal to US Artists International, if you will. Luckily, Marianne is a big advocate of international work, so we have a number of programs looming in the near future. As the primary American members of IFACA, the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, the NEA will be well, well represented at the Eighth World Summit on Arts and Culture in Kuala Lumpur next March. The summit is expected to attract arts leaders and key policymakers from up to 80 countries, including many ministers of culture. Longtime partners, the Japan US Friendship Commission and the NEA invite leading contemporary and traditional artists from the United States to apply for a unique collaborative artistic fellowship designed to highlight US Japan artistic collaboration during the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. The completed collaborative artistic projects will be showcased in Tokyo during the Olympic Games and or Paralympic Games between July and September of 2020. We will select up to five collaborative projects of US-Japan artists representative of diverse genres and regions of both countries. I'll leave you with this brief and moving video about the NEA and why we are important to the United States. <laughs> The 
any I thought that art was important and developing new artists was important. They love art and music just as much as I did. And it was really cool knowing that group of people were supporting me on that. It doesn't matter how great you are and what your abilities are, you need resources to do these things. It's never a bad thing to have arts. Never, never, never. Don't let anybody tell you we don't need that. Uh, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong. It's important. Human beings not only define who they are, but who they want to be through the arts. When an institution like the NEA comes in and says, we get it, we believe this is important, and we're going to put our funding behind it. The NEA comes in, helps organizations be strong, be innovative, make the work that then spreads through the country. As an artist, it's sort of like the holy grail. We pray the NEA does not go away. Otherwise, we lose the support we need to make our art. It's really important that we let people realize how much the NEA has been the backbone quietly of major institutions in the arts, of artists in the arts, of public art projects. program made a difference in my life by showing me the beauty of being creative, the beauty of film. I think it's as essential as food, water, air. A lot of people want to do musical theater, but they don't have it in their community. They don't have anyone funding it. And just the fact that it was there for me, that's why I am where I am now. What we're attempting to do to get through our daily lives and to get through all of the vicissitudes of what's happening in the world right now. It's all expressed in the arts. Thank you for, you know, all the great programs and your dedication to arts in America. I can definitely say that you've changed my life. If everyone was involved in the arts, we would have such a better world. NEA, all the way. Support the National Endowment for the Arts is all I have to say. survive but grow. I make a reverence to the NEA. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Karolina Halatek. I'm uh, from Poland. I um, had the pleasure to be a resident artist at Lomayer Sculpture Park uh, in St. Louis. Uh, so I used my time for um, to produce an art piece actually during my time. So actually it was three weeks. So I would like to share with you the results of, of my stay as an example of, of uh, the thinking I'm, I'm having with about the art generally. So I created, I created the site-specific piece. Uh, and um, just to in the very beginning, I can tell you that the Meyer Sculpture Park is, uh, for, is free. So everyone can enter, uh, and um, and uh, it's a huge space. So a lot of people just uh, you know go for a weekend. A lot of families go, uh, you know, to spend time. Uh, there is a lot of public that is not really relate, like doesn't relate. It's not like a typical art public, like a museum public. 
So um, I could pick up any space, uh, any uh, any space in the park, and I could just create any p kind of piece. Uh, so I like the shelters in the back of the uh, back of the park by the forest. And what I've done, I just transformed the space. Uh, I um, people who who from the community in St. Louis from the area knew that uh, shelters. Uh, as a kind of uh, stop for a picnic or, you know, like just having some sort of like a, a camp, like a campsite for you, for teenagers. So what I've done, I built the walls, like translucive, I used translucive material. I built the walls um, and uh, I used light and uh, I put a uh, smoke, like fog inside, I called the piece Cloud Square. And uh, so I actually I just wanted to, to let people in, uh, like to create this sort of like heavenly um, kind of experience of sky, um, or you know, that kind of space where you can, uh, where you can reflect, where you can, um, uh, where you can take your time and be contemplative. Uh, oh, this is the shelter. This is how it looked. So I created the frame, and uh, I think this is the last image. Yeah. So uh, let's going back to the first one. Um, what I decided to do is I uh, people were queuing. The line was very long, like for six hours for six hours, and, or nearly six hours, there was like, you know, tons of people, people had to be like, crowd had to be uh, controlled by, by like 10 people coming in. But um, what was important for me was uh, the, the openness that everyone could access for free. Uh, I wanted to create a space, like a square, like a place of, like everyone can meet, like you have in uh, like downtown, I mean, in Europe, you have the square where everyone gathers. So that that's why the, the piece is called Cloud Square. So I wanted to create a place where kind of everyone is invited and uh, it's very, uh, it's the space that is very um, free and um, kind of democratic, in a way, in the in the character. So um, and also brings people together, so they have an experience like a collective experience. And this, uh, in a very short moment, let's say in some minutes, they could be together and they can interact together. So they could, uh, I don't know, ask to take a picture. You know, they could interact with each other within that um, that area. So they, in fact, they could maybe, uh, you know, become like friends with neighbors, or you know, there was a possibility a bit a space for interaction, but within very particular uh, experience, which was abstract and uh, and reflective. Uh, so uh, that immersion that came out before as a topic is like I wanted to, uh, to immerse people in a moment when people can actually like uh, reset or they can uh, have time for themselves. They have a time to enjoy the, the life or they can just uh, uh, stop uh, being worried. And uh, I think that all this critical thinking and discussion that we have needs some kind of a proposal. So it's very good to point out, uh, you know, the, the, the to have a critical view, but then the proposal that you were also asking, what's the, what's the solution, what's the what's, what can you propose, is I think that kind of art or this kind of art piece or this kind of art pieces that makes it possible. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Carolina, and thanks everybody. Uh, I'm happy actually to speak after your work because uh, when you showed me these images, the things that first occurred to me was the transparency that you used by building a frame and the context and the possibility for the viewers to be in the same moment inside and to experience themselves and the outside at the same time. And these characteristics um, remind me as well of the practice of my work as a curator and writer and the work related to my institution back in uh, Albania. 
Tirana Art Lab, Center for Contemporary Art, which I have established in 2010, and I've been directing for eight years. So um, we are an engaged institution working with uh, Albanian artists and building a dialogue with international and regional artists. And what is important for us is to create not only to figure out what we want to do, but even how we want to do it. How do we want to construct our work as institution and how do we do our work as curators and producers? And some of the characteristics that have um, been um, very important for our work in the last four years have been the idea of working with the concept of inside out, downside up, and transparency and polyphony, so bringing different voices together. And uh, we try to do this in all our events, and this allows us to, um, let's say, to work with this concept in different layers. Because sometimes I think it's not enough if we do this only in the exhibition space, because exhibition space can, and curatorial practice can sometimes be um, practice of exclusion and selection instead of being a process of inclusion and opening up. So um, I just want to show an example of how actually I do this. So I was in Portland um, at the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art and um, I spent there five weeks and it took me a while to understand where I was and what the context was. I was so far away from home, from Albania, it was nine hours of time difference. So I used the experience that I had there and this time to reflect about my work. So I put together a project that this is the space of um, Portland Institute of Contemporary Art, one of the annexes, and the program that I put together was called Nine Hours Away. So this is the first layer where I start with my work. Um, I brought together, I wanted to show the work of uh, European artists that I've been working with in the last years who are engaged and whose works reflect indirectly and a little bit distantly to the social and political um, problems in the US. So um, there were, this was the space with three screens where um, I showed in the middle, uh, a work from a uh, Russian collective Stodelat, um, then um, a work from uh, Croatian artist Damir Ochko, and um, the work um, of uh, Albanian artist Silva Agostini. And it was important for me that the, the videos change place, because I'm trying to work as well with place and time. Um, and um, what I did as well, and this is as well a way how I curate and um, another aspect that I try to introduce in curating is bringing different elements together. The um, installation that you see behind is part of some details of the work of the American artist Abigail Deville who just had an opening at Paika and her exhibition is actually outside of the space but some of the elements of her installation that she didn't use were there so I actually included them in my show just to continue a dialogue that was there and of course to bring back the viewer and the mind to the space. While So the three first film was, was shown and then in the, in the fourth um, moment the light went on and you could see this installation and then um, together with the local uh, curator and um, um, art historian we recorded a poetical, philosophical um, conversation about my experience there and her experience there, and we included that as well in the work. So the project was a 90-minute piece involving space, time, and different realities and putting them together.
I don't have any images, and we can go on the website. So if you want to get on your gizmos and go to a couple of sites, here, please go ahead and do that. Um, uh, artspacesanctuary.org uh, and sanctuarycaravan.org. I'm not sure what I'm doing here exactly, but um, but I'll do what I do, and I hope that it, it falls somewhere. Um, I uh, founded Art Space Sanctuary a few years ago, and, and you'll see that on the website. It's a, spa it's, a, it's a project that's trying to get art spaces at different levels to sort of take on practice uh, sanctuary-like practices, uh, declare themselves sanctuaries, um, and stand up uh, in this moment where Migration is an important part of the way that our current arrangements are being challenged, our arrangements on a state and nation level, around borders, on all kinds of levels, right? You know this. Um, I, I work closely with the, Na uh, with, with the, with the New Sanctuary Coalition uh, in New York City. Um, I'll say a little bit about that. And um, as well as the Sanctuary Campus Movement, and Karen Coney, who is uh, sitting over there with the very Vera List Center, is part of that. Um, group at the new school and then at NYU, Columbia, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's also weird to be here in this building in, in, in what, what my other friend who's sitting there, Sandra, called a, a fortress, not a sanctuary. And, and to be, um, you know, to, to be part of this real estate company called Columbia University that has, that has displaced so many people right around here in this corner and has done exactly the opposite of anything that a sanctuary practice would actually encourage Right, displacing uh, people and breaking up communities and not being in solidarity and so on and so forth. So, with that irony in mind, uh, we'll 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 be here uh, talking about sanctuary. So, if I'm talking about sanctuary, I think I'll set up the stage a little bit by by saying what sanctuary is. I think people know pieces of it and not all of it. Um, I'm already hearing the music coming, so I'll rush through my words. Um, sanctuary is essentially it started as a Christian. Uh, you know, as, as a Christian policy in the Christian church where people could go inside and in a way hide from the law or to say that, you know, your law is not my law, that there is a higher law and people who were charged with various things by the state, say the Romans, would go into the church and say, you know, I'm immune here. So that practice continued, but it got taken up in the 80s by a number of pastors along the border who were giving refuge to people who were fleeing U.S.-sponsored wars in Central America. Right? And, 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 and we're getting then kicked back out by what was then the INS. And so they were saying, we're <coughs> this doesn't sound right. You know, we're, we're making them flee and then we're not letting them come in. Sanctuary, people were in there. In 2000, and that took its course in 2007, it got revived uh, nationally, including with the New Sanctuary Coalition here, um, but with, with important changes. One, it was, it was uh, immigrant-led. It was led by the affected populations. Secondly, it had an expanded notion of sanctuary, which means that it took that idea, the concept of this protected space where you could be immune from the earthly law, the unjust law, the law of those people who are uh, you know, causing oppression by wielding the law, et cetera. Right? So creating that space, but in fact taking it outside of the church. So we do accompaniments by, by walking, going with people um, undocumented and, and precariously documented to official check-ins at ICE, at courts, et cetera, et cetera, right? To create kind of a citizen shield. Um, we, do, um, we do things like that. And, and one of the projects is, is to create sanctuary spaces in neighborhoods so that slowly between businesses, art spaces, any kind of space, homes, et cetera, you can build out sanctuary as a practice, right? As a practice of openness, as a practice of welcoming, as a practice also that criticizes all the machinery that creates these conditions, right? Which includes petty policing and racist regimes that create uh, 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 the kinds of displacement and the kinds of uh, mass incarceration uh, uh, um, policies that we've seen. It includes uh, working against gentrification, so all, all of these things, that's what we kind of call expanded sanctuary, right? Because we understand that immigration isn't just this little discrete box filled with immigrants only, right? It, it, is, it is, as I said, something that is uh, a process of movement that's challenging all these kinds of arrangements and all the regimes that are trying to contain the movement. So if you want to, uh, you have to move with the movement to see, to have a vision of what to do in the future. Um, so Expanded Sanctuary does all that. And, and, and we also do transnational sanctuary. Uh, we had a conference, Karen was involved in that too, where we're thinking about uh, 
a whole network of shelters from S South America, Central America, all the way up here down over to Canada. So a bunch of activists and scholars and so on were invited. Um, so it's in that kind of context, and I'm probably missing stuff, we can talk about it, um, that I have kind of kept on saying, uh, um, make sanctuary not art. Um, and by, th by that I mean, you know, if you think about the stuff that I just said about what sanctuary is and what kind of space you might be entering in when you enter a sanctuary space, and then think about what kind of space you might be entering when you enter, I mean, to choose the worst of the worst, but to when you enter MoMA, right? When you enter an art world space, right? What is that? What is the political ecology? What is the moral economy of the art world? Now, of course, it's expansive. Of course, it's very different, and there's diverse, and there's cultural organizations all the way up to the other side. Nevertheless, there is something like an art world moral economy, an art world political ecology. And just to quickly cite a couple of what I think, uh, you know, the way I think about it a little bit is this, that if you think about, um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of foundations and other people here with big money backers behind them, right? But that's essentially the, the, the ecology that I want to just point to a little bit. If you have somebody like Leon Black as a chair of the board of MoMA who has made a lot of his fortune, and I'm not, you know, this is a caricature in a sense, and it's not because all the boards are filled with versions of Leon Black, right? Who's made his, who's made his money um, uh, sitting next to, holding hands with the Kushners and the Trumps, making Manhattan a real estate venture, again, creating displacement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so that person who is also then on the board of a bunch of other companies, whose board members are also on the board of a bunch of other foundations, like the Barish, right? So you have this level of, uh, I don't know, a network, right, of, 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 of these financial workers. Now, what, 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 what else do these financial workers do? They were, a lot of them are hedge fund managers who's, who themselves or their partners are on the board. Um, they invest in companies like Rio Tinto, this is the case with uh, somebody on the on the Barishnikov Center. Uh, Rio Tinto has not opened up. It's a mining company, extractivism. It's a, a, a company who has never had uh, 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 a, a, a place that has been opened up without protest, without labor issues, uh, without displacement of indigenous populations, and without major pollution. And that becomes the source of uh, uh, the major source of money that feeds one of the hedge funds that feeds the Barishnikov Center. What do those policies do? They displace people and migrants start moving, right? So it's a whole cycle. That's what I mean by the political ecology of the art world. And I think until we also tackle that part of it, right, that displaces people, brings people all the way here, unprotected, we're not gonna have the full-on sanctuary space and the sanctuary policies that at least I would like to see and advocate for. So one of the things I encourage people to do is, you know, not just have diversity and safety policies and so on. All of that is great and good and we want to push more, but also to look at the board, look at the investments, look at where all that stuff is also uh, 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 producing the things that we claim to not like. Okay, that's it. Sanctuary Caravan, the new, the new Sanctuary Coalition, an amazing uh, organization here, is putting together a caravan of supporters to meet. Uh, we're in touch with, with, the, with the refugee caravan that's coming up. In fact, uh, uh, many of them have already arrived in Tijuana. They're moving to the Tijuana border. Uh, they're slowly already getting there. We're putting together, look it up, newsanctuarycaravan.org, a team of people um, large, as many uh, thousands of people who are going to go down there to do various things, including uh, processing claims, accompanying across back and forth, but also witnessing uh, because there's been a promise of violence and we know that one of the things, that one of the only things that this administration has delivered on is their promise of violence. We see it in Pittsburgh, we see it uh, in Kentucky, we see it everywhere. So that's part of what we want to do, meet there, witness, sign up. There's, there's ways to do that on the website. You'll have to stay uh, to wait for Noor. She's in the building, but she has just arrived. And uh, I see her on the
reach nor with flee nor come back to me for Hello, um, uh, thank you, uh, CC, ArtsLink, and uh, Simon and Maxim uh, for inviting me. So I have nothing to do this year with the ArtsLink. Um, um, I thought... You did one year with the ArtsLink, you're correct. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, and... Um, um, Actually, I think one, one of the reasons why I'm here is that uh, I have done Arts Link twice. And um, uh, I'm from Estonia, uh, running, uh, uh, or I'm the artistic director of uh, Balto Skandal Festival, but that's not my ma main job. Uh, 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 that's more the foreigners know I do. Um, Actually, I'm, I'm running a, um, um, a space, a theatre, performing arts centre, very small though, but very active, Kanuti Gildi Saal, and um, let's see. First time I came here with ArtsLink was 1995. This is how New York looked like, 1995. Yeah, it almost looks looks the same. Um, uh, contemporary art was um, in the front line also back then. This is the cover of uh, the New Yorker. It's the artist is Anita Kunz. Um, as you as you see, not much have changed. Uh, also, the um, you you recognize the place. Uh, it's uh, uh, photographer Tom O'Connor. Um, and so this all was in um, 90, um, 1995. Um, you, can, you can just imagine um, um, what, what a person coming from, um, um, uh, from a Soviet-ruled uh, Soviet country um, and not Soviet Union country, like uh, let's say there are many countries who are Soviet Union, but where the Soviet time ended just some um, years ago, before it. Um, it ended 91, so it only took four years after that uh, um, uh, when, I, uh, when I came here. And why I came here was that in 1992, we. Um, we started to work in uh, in Estonia, in Tallinn, with um, with the idea that um, contemporary dance, contemporary dance especially, was sort of non-existing um, non-existing art form in um, uh, Soviet time. If somebody would call um, uh, even 91 or 92 to the Ministry of Culture in Estonia and ask something about contemporary dance or modern dance, back then it was called more modern dance then the answer would be that th we don't have modern dance. Mm, uh, and uh, so we, we started with a couple of friends to organize a thing called um, a Dance Information Center in Estonia in 92. And the main, and really the main idea was um, to just spread information uh, about it. 92, no internet, yeah, facts. Fax was the, uh, the the communication and phone uh, phones, so um, the only idea was that really to get contacts to that somebody would send you a dance magazine uh, from different countries and you could uh, pick up from there something and then uh, translate it and put uh, make your own sort of flyers or, or some kind of things. Uh, very soon we after that we. Um, we we started to do um, um, uh, organize um, workshops for the um, for the dancers because the the country was full of dancers they were all folk ballet and so on so but not uh, not obviously not modern or or, or contemporary uh, 
in 92, not, something has started to change because uh, Tallinn is only 86 kilometers away from Helsinki, Finland, and, um, and there the local TV started to sh show uh, performances, I don't know, by Aylin Neely, uh, Maurice Bejar, and so on and so on. So some people already started to know um, uh, what is it. I was chosen, uh, I don't know why, uh, uh, to be the Arsling Fellow and come here to New York um, to be in a residency or organizing residency because uh, by no means I'm a choreographer or, or dancer. Um, I was just interested and very fascinated about the, uh, the new, for me, um, the mu new and very progressive um, uh, art form as modern or contemporary dance back then was. I was hosted here in New York by um, American Dance Festival and legendary Charles and uh, Stephanie Reinhardt. And uh, those who know um, them uh, uh, obviously also understand that I, I, I got um, I got free tickets to absolutely everything, what's, what was going on. All sold out performances, everything, everything. But uh, uh, because I had so, um, so good friends, uh, I got um, mm, everywhere, in everywhere. So imagine then that you are here in New York, um, where were uh, artists like, um, I don't know, Mark Dendy, Elizabeth Strepp, Paul Taylor, Mears Cunningham, Yoshi Kochuma, Martha Graham, were actually, um, they, they were not just history, but they were part of it. And so a guy um, from, um, no, I don't know, black and white, or maybe better to say uh, red and white world, coming here and understanding that um, uh, the world around us is so much um, varied. There, there can be so many different versions of expressing yourself through art. That the, that the, and most, most uh, importantly for me, that the measure of artistic quality is not skillfulness or trained body, we're talking still about dance, um, but your message and um, the way you have originally uh, chosen the way to express your message in the measure is is the measure of uh, for an artist, and uh, today uh, to this day, I have mainly after that worked with artists who have um, that message to de to deliver, not the truth, uh, but an idea, um, a new way of uh, shedding light uh, to the world. I could not have discovered that without this first experience in America. Uh, the idea of how colorful uh, the word actually is. Um, this is also part, uh, when we started our, um, our projects then back in Estonia, we uh, opened Kanuti Gildisal, which is the, uh -huh, which this is how it looks like outside. It's an old, very old building um, in the very, very center of uh, old town, Tallinn, med medieval town. Uh, that's, this was established in a way uh, that um, we knew that uh, this place, this building is um, uh, free. There was nobody, there were some uh, homeless people uh, living on the third floor, making open fire in the winter because it gets uh, very cold. So we, we understood that there is a possibility uh, to, um, to start to use the, uh, the building. And um, actually what, what really happened was that the, uh, back then, the, the community of uh, modern dance or contemporary dance, all 20 people <laughs> came together and we, we, we had to decide like, okay, uh, are we taking it? There is no money, um, but uh, are we, uh, are we I the, the city said that they could give us the building, but no money involved. Um, and um, after a uh, three, four hour discussion, we decided that, okay, um, we will do it. Um, uh, and that's how it started now, 19 um, uh, years ago. 
Now uh, it looks inside, it looks like, uh, like this at the moment. Um, and from the beginning, everything was done um, um, by volunteers. Volunteers meaning either dancers, choreographers, or dance students. And by, uh, by this day, um, all the, for example, the front door ticket, everything, this is done by the uh, by uh, volunteers. Oh, uh, fortunately, my time is over. I qu very quickly, very quickly show you a couple of other pictures. Uh, this uh, uh, is the same looking uh, for special performance. As you see, it has turned into a slide. And um, as many people here today talked about the responsibility, I have uh, one, uh, one uh, very short uh, story to tell you about responsibility. Two weeks ago, a state theater, uh, uh, a th theater which, which is supported 100% by the state ensemble theater, in, in Estonia called Theatre Number no. 99, which is the most touring, uh, uh, internationally most touring theatre in Estonia. Uh, and the, the idea of the theatre was to do uh, 99 premieres in, and then end. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, when uh, they had more, uh, 30 more premieres to do, and 14 years they had existed to do these 70 uh, productions, they decided to stop, to give uh, money back to the government, to give the building and the theater space back to the, to the government uh, and say, next, uh, next guys can do it what they want. We don't have any more ideas. This is the responsibility of artists. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Noor Zafar and I'm an attorney with the ACLU. Um, a part of my work at the ACLU is I work in the National Security Project and in that project what we do is challenge abusive uh, government policies in the national security space, challenge abusive immigration and criminal law policies as well. Um, I want to thank Simon and ArtsLink for putting together this program and for inviting me to give a short presentation. So what I want to do in my talk is build upon this concept of solidarity, but I want to look at it from a slightly different angle. Um, you know, because in my work, what we see a lot is that different government policies that are discriminatory and abusive actions by the state are often interconnected. And we see this repeatedly, right? In, a policy can be enacted as a national security measure, but it ends up having negative impacts and, and discriminatory impacts on certain groups of immigrants. So that highlights for me, and that highlights for me the fact that it's all the more important for our resistance to these policies to be um, similarly collaborative and intersectional because, you know, they, because these policies themselves are interconnected, therefore the resistance to them must take into account the, the intersectional nature of, of these policies. And I want to use the example of the Muslim ban to further highlight and elucidate this point. So when the Muslim ban was um, enacted, the underlying or the primary rationale for the ban was the Trump administration basically said that the president has unchecked power as, a, as an executive to exclude anyone he wants based on nat for national security reasons, right? That was the underpinning rationale of the ban is that the, the executive, he has been given this power to unilaterally decide who can and cannot come into this country. And if the president unilaterally decides that a group of people pose some sort of national security threat, that he has the power to exclude them. This rationale was upheld and endorsed when the Supreme Court um, allowed the ban to stay in place. So in doing so, you know, if you read through the court's opinion, a big 
a big part of the argument that the plaintiffs made was that you have to look at the president's statements, you have to look at the statements that his deputies and other people in the administration made, and if you do that, it's fairly clear that this policy is not based on national security, but that this policy is a xenophobic, Islamophobic, racist policy um, that pretty much enacts the xenophobia that Trump um, kind of rode uh, on during his campaign and, and into his presidential um, tenure. The court ignored all that, saying that's irrelevant, and instead basically agreed with the Trump administration in saying that the, the president does have unlimited power, and if he says national security, then that means that national security is actually what's at, at issue, and that can be used to exclude uh, groups of people, and that can be used to enact a discriminatory immigration policy. So now, fast forwarding to a couple months later, uh, I'm sure many of you read about this um, last week, the president enacted a ban, an asylum ban that essentially um, prevents people, individuals, migrating from Central American countries um, from receiving asylum. And it's interesting because if you look at, um, so this, this ban was also enacted via a presidential proclamation, unilateral executive order. And if you look at the text of this proclamation, it relies on the very same authority that underpinned the Muslim ban, namely that the president has unchecked executive power and that if he says a group of people pose a national security threat, that those individuals can be excluded because he has the power to do that. So, I mean, what this connection between the Muslim ban and this new asylum ban shows is that policies and rationales and, and reasonings that are used in one realm to exclude one group of people, if those are sanctioned by the courts, which, you know, which the Muslim ban was, they will very quickly and can very easily be used to target a completely different group of people um, under a very similar rationale. And, you know, we, we know, and anyone who kind of, you know, looks at President Trump's comments and takes them at face value knows that both the Muslim ban and all the rhetoric preceding it and this, uh, you know, asylum ban and the rhetoric preceding it is grounded in racism and it's grounded in xenophobia. But the court, but the Supreme Court, when it refused to look at all that, essentially sanctioned the use of national security as a sort of pretext um, to allow the president, to allow the, the executive to discriminate. So that just shows some interesting connections between, uh, you know, a policy that was designed to exclude Muslims and then a policy that is designed to exclude uh, Latino refugees and migrants. Um, and the, the parallels don't stop there. I think they go a little bit further. So this, you know, I, I spoke about how kind of in the domestic realm, in the realm of domestic policy, domestic law, there's these interconnections between national security and immigration. That extends to the global space as well, because um, if you, you know, in both the Central American countries from where these migrants are coming and in the Middle Eastern countries, or primarily Middle Eastern countries from which um, Muslims have been excluded, the U.S. has a pretty long history of, of imperialism and war making and military intervention. Right, and it's not—it's it, not a coincidence that the U.S. has been in, involved in very negative ways in in both parts of these worlds, and created the conditions from which people are fleeing. And then, when those people are trying to flee those conditions and seek refuge in this country, we're turning around and excluding them. So, you know, an example um, in Guatemala, the U.S. and, and this is. This is like you know a history that throughout the 80s repeated itself in various Central American countries, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in Honduras, in Nicaragua. In all of these countries, the U.S. supported right-wing regimes that were brutally oppressive towards their people, and it supported military coups that created, you know, decades of violence, which is or the effects of which we're seeing to this day, and and the effects of which are precisely what people are fleeing from. So the U.S. is not, you know, some kind of innocent bystander when it comes to people all of a sudden showing up at its borders. Like, there's a history um, and a global history to this that we have to recognize. And, and I think in order to have policies, immigration policies that are, uh, that are moral, that are compassionate, we really have to understand history um, in a way that I think oftentimes in this country we try to ignore. We have a very short-sighted view of. Um, similarly, in the Middle East, the same story repeats itself, maybe in, on a little bit more of a recent timeline. You know, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, it destabilized that region and created conditions that led to the rise of ISIS, 
which is now destabilizing Syria, which is where a lot of these refugees um, and immigrants that we have banned are coming from. The U.S. is complicit in the in the Saudi led war in Yemen, which has created one of the worst humanitarian crises of our lifetimes. And um, we've always had kind of like tension with Iran ever since we uh, supported a coup that overthrew their democratically elected prime minister. And that's just been an ongoing source of um, really brutal um, economic and foreign policies towards that country. So I think, you know, just pointing out these intersections in, in both the domestic space and globally, to me, highlights two points, right? The first is that these links between the Muslim ban and the asylum ban and the links between uh, these bans and U.S. foreign policy emphasizes the fact that our resistance to these policies has to be intersectional. And we have to understand that um, you know, one, one law or one group of policies that's used to target one group of people can easily be used to target a different group of people and that we've seen through the Muslim and the asylum bans. At the same time, our resistance to these policies also has to take into account a sort of global understanding of the issue in a global framework because oftentimes policies that are enacted here in the U.S. have global repercussions and people across the world feel repercussions of things that we um, that we allow our lawmakers to sanction. So I think those are just two important principles to keep in mind when thinking about um, how do we kind of continue to resist abusive and discriminatory state policies. And then just one last point about the usefulness of courts. I think when the Muslim, when the Supreme Court upheld the Muslim ban, it was a a pretty disheartening moment for a lot of lawyers because just by virtue of our profession, we put a lot of faith in the courts. And I think that highlighted for a lot of folks that while maybe the courts can continue to be one avenue of redress, that they should not be the exclusive avenue of redress. And the, the real organizing and the real resistance and the real change happens when people organize and people get together and people change the narratives and change the stories that we tell about others. Because the courts never lead change, they always follow change. And I think we, in, you know, we as people and we as communities and we as people of conscience have to create the change and change the narrative so that the courts and the legal system can then follow. Thank you. everyone um, thank you to CC Arts Link and ARC in general for supporting me during this residency um, our theme of reflection is uh, transformation and uh, I decided to talk about it to reflect a bit about it uh, through my own practice which looks at uh, the way in which neoliberalism um, shifts the way we relate to one another and how we perceive different understandings of uh, temporality and spatiality. Um, and one of them is this possibility where time is money, um, which in which time gets quantified and monetized. Um, and uh, you'd say, you know, this is like a daily saying that I even seen on the subways in New York. But also what it's interesting for me is that this is a saying that uh, has been coined in Renaissance by Leon Battista Alberti. So um, in, in a book he wrote, uh, I Libri della Familia, um, where he was trying to talk about uh, uh, money and household and education and marriage. Um, then from time, um, I was thinking about space and how also space gets compressed physically, uh, but then also gets expanded digitally and virtually. Um, and uh, at the same time, it gets removed from ourselves and disembodied, and we have this relation with space which filtered through new technologies becomes abstracted in a way that I'm still trying to understand. Um, and um, 
maybe related to this is also that uh, the boundaries between leisure and labor are getting more and more blurred and then like the term job is replaced to occupation and then I'm thinking like what that implies in terms of performing constantly, of constantly producing creative content, of constantly being present um, in a way that also changes the way uh, we interact. Um, so in my work, I'm also trying to perform um, in different places. Um, and as Barbara was saying earlier about this, uh, maybe like these changes in temporality and spatiality and uh, um, socioeconomical context also allow for a, a place of disruption where we can rethink uh, the way we are normalized or conditioned or uh, performing a collective choreography. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this um, in my works and these are some examples of places where I, uh, I did some performances. This is the studio at Art in General, so it's just now during the residency. Um, and uh, yeah, like all these um, spaces that uh, allow me to think of this relation between choreography as an artistic practice and um, social choreographies that we can encounter in uh, public spaces and uh, yeah how we can just think about relations differently and I will move now I will pass to Philip thank you thank you Raluca so hi everyone my name is Philip and I'm from Serbia and I'm gonna talk about transformations on more of a like a private level because um, bef before I even know anything about sexuality or gender, I was often told that I'm maybe too, too girly or not masculine enough for a boy in terms of Serbian standards. So I um, often use transformation to kind of blend in and kind of not be seen that, that often in my natural kind of uh, state, like how I usually behave. But um, one thing that was always there was um, creating characters and characters like these and um, but through time as I sta started to like learn more about myself and as I, st I started to explore my queer identity I started to use my own body to present these characters and kind of I got into um, makeup and um, costumes etc so um, <clears throat> I started to yeah, I use my own body for transformation. And even though I still use like pencils, brushes, paint and everything, I al always come back to acting it out myself and taking photos myself. And um, what I feel about, tra about transformation in my case is that it's, it's a liberation of my creativity because I feel like in that way I can express like every idea I have in my mind and kind of like express each and every interest of mine, um, both painting or like now even physical expression. But um, what I also found out, found out about transformation in my case is that it is a healing process for me because during the time when I would sit down and put on makeup and kind of like shift to this, ca this character that I'm gonna act out later in front of the camera, I kind of always lose a part of myself and kind of go away from the everyday kind of struggle or problem. And through the, through the time, by the time I finish up my um, photo shoots and stuff, I would feel like completely as exhausted, like, like an athlete, kind of exhausted but, but feel fulfilled. And I could kind of come back to my everyday issues and struggles. So it, it kind of helps me to both express myself and kind of get away from what I'm used to hearing. And through, ta through time, I also realized that um, this kind of expression was actually even more appreciated by others, actually people who care about me in general, but I got to connect with more people through this. So I realized that this kind of transformation is something that enriches my life and it should not be um, hidden, not shouldn't remain hidden. But um, also I wanted to mention that the four photos that I showed you today are actually four photos that were published either online or like were used for Fashion Week in Serbia because they were all collaboration with fashion designers. And I feel like in a sense by being um, out there both in like 
social media and maybe like something more commercial. I feel like I'm kind of transforming also like the scene of, of Serbian view at like different kind of beauty because maybe fashion is like a way to do it, but I feel like I reach out to, to, the, to people who wouldn't actually maybe be interested in such things. And I feel like I explore more beauties of fashion in Serbia by doing so. So, um, yeah, but this is, this is a part of my, my queer expression and I hope you all signed up so we can continue on a conversation upstairs. But um, I want to finish up by thanking everyone for coming and by inviting my fellows to join me here. And um, so we're gonna move to the eighth floor. Hope you will join us so we can share more of our artwork and we can have a deeper conversation about everything we do. Thank you.